Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode two of the Intermission Podcast, the show where two film students discuss iconic, classic, and obscure films from times gone by. I got it down. It took me you a week. You fucking smashed that, mate. That was brilliant. Uh, <laughs> we're your hosts, Oscar W. Fitchett. Oh, Robbie Sweetel. Beautiful. And <laughs> uh, I start this off with a thank you to all the support from the first episode. Secret fact, I don't know if we've got any support because this has been recorded I, the day of it being uploaded. So I, I don't, don't know. Aoife has been know. putting stuff on her story, so thanks, Aoife, I guess. Has she? Yeah, I saw her put something on the other day, which was nice. Oh, of She's like, go support these guys. Oh, yeah, I saw that one. Yeah. That, what a nice legend. One. Nice one. And I had to specifically say to Gary... No, I sent it to the chat earlier, and I went, and I went, get it down, you lads. And I went, only Gary can watch the first 50 minutes because he's a proper wet flannel who hasn't seen The Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. No spoilers for you, Gary. No spoilers for you, Gary. Um, before we get into the film itself, I want to start this off with a little bit of a, a little bit of a, um, something to say. It's relevant to the podcast itself. Go on. Um, before you heard my wonderful voice talking, you would have heard the, uh, theme song by Lewis Hamilton, which I have heard as of the time of recording this now, cause he actually did it. And I want to, I want to, um, again, Lewis Hamilton, my friend, not the F1 racing driver. Ha ha. I'm so original. Um, <laughs> and here's a mini story about how that theme happened. I asked him. Before we even recorded the first episode of the podcast, Robbie, could he whip up a 10 second theme? Right. And and he went, when do you want it for? I went, I don't know, before the weekend. We filmed the episode, I think on the Thursday. Yeah. On on a Thursday. I went, I don't know, before the weekend, you know, or like mm. by the weekend. He went, yeah, that's easy enough done. To which he then got himself Silent Hill on PS1 <laughs> and didn't do anything on the weekend except play Silent Hill. And <laughs> to which he was like, oh, if I'm being perfectly honest, it got to Monday, I think. Oh, no, Sunday evening, Sunday night. And if I'm being perfectly honest, Oscar, I haven't done anything with the song. <laughs> yeah, God, it hasn't. Brilliant. And this is me who's had the podcast edited waiting for this theme song. So I was, <laughs> I, I had it ready by the for that weekend. So I was like, oh, you know, okay. And he went, when do you when do you want it for? I went before. Can I have it before Thursday? He went, yeah, yeah, all right, that's fine. <laughs> it got a Tuesday night. He was like, right, tomorrow I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna <laughs> do, I'm gonna do it all. So it's like you didn't have to, Lewis. You're not. Uh, God, why did you pull this off? Why did you like wait? So he did the theme song on the on the Wednesday. Got it sent to me on the night, and that's when I put it on the intermission Twitter and uh, instagram i was like hey we got the theme good stuff <laughs> so i was like yeah i you know plan get this upload by friday so on literally on the thursday morning i had it i opened up premiere pro and i had the episode one episode one up mm. i was just about hit enter for export and then i got a message from lewis being like yeah, I'm gonna redo the 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 song because um, the mixing's a bit crap, so I just want to remix it. What? And I went, Lewis, you literally like I was just about to hit export, mate. And then he went, and he went Oh, it shouldn't take too long. It's just the the mixing isn't great. I just rushed it out. I went, Okay, fair enough. And it went, <laughs> when, when when were you gonna upload it? I went, I was gonna upload it on Friday so I can make it public on Saturday. And he went. No, oh, it won't be too. It would shouldn't take too long. Didn't hear anything from the man until um, <laughs> we were talking still, but not about the music. And then he, and then I went to him, Lewis. Have you done the music yet? Have you done the remixing yet? He went, Oh no, not yet. I went, shouldn't take too long though. I went, Right, his, this was on Friday morning, by the way. And I went to him, Right, Lewis, look. I'm going to upload the podcast how it is, and you can just give me the remix theme later. It doesn't sound any different to me. And he, and he went, and then, like, literally a minute later, he was like, oh, I just did it. Here it is. I went, why didn't you do it why, instantly? Why? <laughs> <laughs> and then I, and so then I listened to the song. I was like, if I'm being perfectly honest, Lewis, I don't hear any difference, but that's why you're the musician and I'm not. So, yeah. 
I want to say thank you to Lewis, but also, Lewis, mate, you're meant to be an educator. Sort it out. You know, how, how <laughs> also, do, thank you. Uh, thank it sounds you, really cool. I like it. It's, it's a cool theme. I like it a lot. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I list, in my notes, in my show notes, I've got introduction, introduction slash banter, and underneath that... <laughs> introduction bullet, slash banter. And underneath that, bullet that. pointed, I've got call out Lewis. So I did Brilliant. that. And <laughs> so Lewis, you've been called out. You can respond in any way you like. If you want to do a diss track or something, just drop it on your Instagram. <laughs> I'd love to see it. He's he's literally just going to message me and be like, you're a... You're a you're a numpty. You know I, mean? <laughs> I know, I know. Right, so, episode one, we talked about The Godfather. Yeah. From 1972. And I gave you the option, Robbie, of which way should we go? Should we go 70s Pacino or 70s Coppola? And you went with 70s Coppola. Yes. Which led us on to this week's episode, which is... The 1974 crime mystery drama, The Conversation, which came out the same year as The Godfather Part 2. And the film is written and directed by Francis Ford Coppola, and it stars Gene Hackman, John Cazale, Alan Garfield, Cindy Williams, Frederick Forrest, and a bit of Harrison Ford. And Yeah, right. That was the first thing that jumped out on me in the credits. I was like, wait, hang on, what? I was very confused. <laughs> and also another actor who's a bit of a spoiler, so I'm going to wait till we get on the spoiler section because I think it's fun not to know that he's in it until he pops up and you're like, okay. wait, is that, is that? Wait, what? And then, <laughs> yeah. And the plot synopsis of the conversation, according to IMDb, is a paranoid secretive surveillance expert has a crisis of conscience when he suspects that the couple he is spying on will be murdered. I think that's an appropriate plot Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, I, I, discover, I discovered Letterboxd, is, Letterboxd isn't great for synopsis is from when I read The Godfather one out and we yeah. were kind of like, is that? Is that, that what it's about? That doesn't sound right. So. so I decided to go with Letterboxd for this and um, a few accolades of the conversation is that on Rotten Tomatoes, it's got a 98% on the toma- tomato meter and an audience score of 90%. It's got a 7.8 out of 10 on IMDb. It has 4.1 out of 5 stars on Letterboxd. And it was nominated for a Writers Guild of America Award for Best Drama Written for the Screen, nominated for a Directors Guild of America Award for Outstanding Directorial Achievement, Nominated for five BAFTA awards, including Best Screenplay, Best Director, and Best Actor, and winning two of two BAFTAs, including Best Soundtrack and Best Film Editing. It was nominated for four Golden Globe Awards, including Best Screenplay, Best Actor in a Drama for Gene Hackman, Best Director Francis Ford Coppola, and Best Drama Picture. Uh, nominated for three Academy Awards, including Best Sound. Best Original Screenplay for Francis Ford Coppola and Best Picture. Uh, in the 1974 Cannes Film Festival, it was the winner of the Palme d'Or, which is, which I I kind of have it on equal level to Best Picture almost for an Academy Award. And on a little side note, it this is Francis Ford Coppola's personal favourite film that he has made. So, yeah. which I think, all those accolades and the filmmaker himself thinks it's his best film which i think is probably the biggest accolade in itself yeah so with this viewing of the conversation um this is my second time viewing this film Mm -hmm. uh your first robbie and this is a film that i that gets overshadowed a lot because again it's a francis ford coppola film that came out in 1974 that isn't the godfather part two yeah which so a lot of people talk Godfather Part 2, more so the conversation. Um, and I can't remember how I discovered it. I think I I genuinely can't remember how I discovered it. I think I remember hearing that it was a good film. And I saw that, you know, upon my many HMV raids, I it, I just got it at yeah. one point. So I thought, oh, you know what, give it a go. And I watched this for the first time, um, oh, maybe two years ago now. Two years sounds about right. And my overall initial initial thoughts of the film, it, spoiler free, obviously, um, I absolutely love this film. I think it's a highly underappreciated film in terms of the community, like film community, because again, 
obviously. Godfather Part Two exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it does. <laughs> Uh, but I do think that if this, if Coppola did brought this film out any other time, that it, I'm not sure if it, it's definitely his more subtler, subtler film in a mm-hmm. sense. I think, and I think it's, um, I think it's such a really interesting film, and I think it has one of the best lead acting performances of. Um, one of the best, I would say just one of the best lead acting performances because it's not, it. and a lot of people might be like, wait, what, really? I, I, I love it because it's really not showy. It's really quite yeah. a solid performance. And I think that, especially on second viewing, the pacing flies beautifully and I just get so fascinated by what's happening in it. And yeah, I think it's one of the more interesting films that's been done Um within the last uh, 50 years, really. So that's just my general initial starter thoughts. Thought, starter thoughts. Robbie, what's your uh, initial thoughts of the conversation? Okay, I'd like to get this pun out of the way before I begin. Um, let's have a conversation about the conversation. Ha 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 ha. Yeah, it's good. It's real good. I, I, I really liked it. I thought it was really cool. Um... Gene Hackman is amazing in this movie. Like, he's so good. Um, I love his character. Uh, I'll get more into talking about the character specifically in the spoilers. But um, I just, yeah, it's really good. Really well written. Really nuanced. Like you said, really interesting film. Deals with a lot of different films about... Uh, films? Different themes about, uh, like, morality and all that kind of thing. Yeah. It, it's really good. Like, it's... I, I'd never heard of it until you told me to watch it for the podcast. And, um, yeah, I'm glad you recommended it because it's really good. Uh, there's only, like, one thing that I don't like, but that's spoiler things. Yeah. Uh, let's jump into spoiler-free positives at the moment. We've kind of discussed it there. Gene Hackman is yeah excellent in this film. And, um, again, I, I, another fun... Fun trivia. Again, we'll get further into it later. Uh, but I think it's relevant for this specific point. I discussing that this is Coppola's favorite. Mentioning this is Coppola's favorite film of his. Mm-hmm. He's to, this is Gene Hackman's favorite movie that he's acted in. I which, can see that. Yeah, which, and I. I mean, I. I think French Connection he was in, which I haven't seen. French Connection. Neither have uh, I. I've never seen Mississippi Burning as well as one. That's neither a, have I. I think that's I on think Netflix. One. Yeah, it is at the yeah. minute. Yeah. And he was also in Royal Tenenbaums, which I love that film. And I love him in that film. Two very different types of performances. Never seen it. You've never seen Tenenbaums, have you? No. Oh, mate, we need to do a West Anderson. <laughs> we, we need to have a Wes Anderson thing for this podcast at some we point. We do, yeah. That would be brilliant. But Royal Tenenbaums is great. But I think that's interesting how both Coppola and Hackman... Well, Coppola thinks it's the best film he's made. And Hackman thinks it's the best film that he's acted in. Which... Mm-hmm. I, yeah, and I think Hackman, this is a true character piece. And in my notes here, I've said, because on the surface, this is just a surveillance film. It's, uh, yeah. that's how, that's how it gets into you. Like, and we've kind of like dis- uh, learned this through educating ourselves on how to pitch a film. This is clearly pitched more so as like a, um, the initial pitch would be, oh, it's a C- it's a surveillance film where, a surveillance guy thinks that a couple that he's looking into might get murdered. Like that's the yeah. pitch. That's the tag. But what it is, it's truly is just like a pure character study on Harry Cole. And it's yeah. just like, that's what it is. And you need a, you need a strong actor to be able to pull something off like that um, in order to carry the film. And I don't even necessarily mean sympathetic. Cause I, I'll argue that I'm not sure if Harry Cole is a sympathetic character. Uh, I, yeah, I was going to say, he, he's he, when you get more into his character and you find more out about him, he's kind of a bad bloke. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, Hackman is so good in the film that you don't, like, you're still endeared and, like, brought into his character quite a lot. You know? I yeah. Just... No, yeah, definitely. And I think that... Um... Uh, that, that that seems to be a theme that the seventies really brought in was almost the the flawed protagonist, and we, you know, we watched 
Godfather the last for last week, and you know, and Michael is definitely he, that's a show in how someone becomes flawed, and yeah. you know, and I think there's a lot of films in the set, and I mean, we'll learn about it when we for next week when Godfather Part Two, and the week after that with Apocalypse Now. I think that what the 70s does best is explore flaws in characters. And I think that this film, The Conversation, does it in such a beautifully subtle way. Like, it really is, like, just, yeah. like, like, nothing outright is shown or happens in the film to make you think, ah, Harry's a bit dodgy. It's all through, like, mostly Hackman's performance, really. Yeah. That Like, and I think that, uh, but obviously hackman's great we'll discuss more about why we think that about him yeah. uh, but i also think the other actors in it are really like play a- yeah the supporting cast is great I, I mean i was gonna say about the um the dude that shows up that's kind of um uh, harry's rival for like a little bit he's only in a small portion of it oh, um, um- mm, yes. i can't remember what is the character's name is i the think ga- the, the the new york uh, yeah, the New York. Scene, yeah. yeah, I'll look he, up his name. Yeah. I really liked. It. He's not in it a lot. He's in it for about half an hour, mm. like just a small segment of it. But like, he made a really good impression on me. Harrison Ford made quite an impression. I yes. think it was just a surprise that he was in the movie because I didn't think he'd. I didn't expect him to be in a film at this point. Yeah. Well, my well. It was 1974, so it was a year after American Graffiti, and of course we know right, Copeland, yeah. we know Copeland and Lucas are mates. Uh, yeah, mates. Uh, Bernie is the guy's. Is Bernie, the that's now. the one. Yeah, that's I the really like him. Alan Garfield. Yeah. Fun fact about um, Harrison Ford is that um, his part was significantly smaller, but mm. Copeland liked Ford's um, uh, audition, so he extended oh, right. it for any even so far as giving him a name because apparently he was just an assistant. Yeah. And that was literally it. But he liked Harrison's for performance so much. That he it's a bit decided. like Star Wars then, isn't it? With yeah. Han Solo. Because he got brought into um, as someone for them to read off until yes. they could find who was going to play Han Solo. And they thought, well, he's, he's good at it, so just give him it. Yeah. And that, that's how he ended up being Han Solo. I'm not going to lie. When when I saw his name pop up, I thought, I, I remembered that he was in it. And then Palmer was like, and then my next thought, my thoughts like, oh yeah, I forgot he's in this. And then my next thought was like, I wonder what Robbie's reaction is to that. <laughs> I right. We'll get on to when I start getting into my notes because <laughs> my, but yeah, one of my very first notes is is quite funny. <laughs> yeah. So um I um yeah, so I think the supporting cast works beautifully with it as with Hackman as well. We uh Ford, I think, does a really good job for what he's in there. Um, Alan Garfield, who plays Bernie, I do agree. I think he's really good. Yeah, he just really stood out to me, yeah. Yeah, and of course, once again, John Cazale back in. A Big film. old forehead. Big old forehead. He's back in it. There's even a poster in their office of just his big old head. Did you see that? There's just I like a, we- there's a weird like cartoon drawing of his massive face. I just there see- on the wall. I didn't see that at all. What, do, you know what, do you know what took me off guard about? Um, there was a part with him where they're in a they're in a, the warehouse office and then he's leaving yeah. the room and then he's just off on a scooter yeah because the scooter's not shown before so all of a sudden they, you know i'm not gonna say anything about what no, happens yeah. in the scene beforehand but he leaves the room then all of a sudden you say like me where when why I, I, I do admit that did take me off guard i was like wait when did that happen when, when? yeah well because yeah. i just thought it was like a door, and then he'd go down some stairs, and he'd be out of the building. Yeah, yeah. Or he would just, or he would just walk to the door. Yeah, because isn't there, is there not a lift in there? Yeah. I'm pretty sure later in the movie there's a lift that people go down. So how do they get the moped there, and how does he get it down? I I don't think he, they go down the. I think he just rides it to the lift, and then he gets off, and then he gets in the lift. <laughs> Why? Um, let's, oh, you haven't seen the Nobelisa. I was gonna say there's a bit of there's a thing in the Nobelisa that rings perfect to that and it's a fu- i'm not even gonna ruin the joke because i really i want right. you to watch that and there's a that reminds you of something that happens in anomaly so that is funny as hell but yeah <laughs> um but again he's i think that because uh, it's all hackman hackman's in it from yeah he's... like it's it's like how you know how people talk about like oh joaquin phoenix is in enough all the uh, 
in every frame of Joker. It's yeah, Gene like Hackman that, is in every single scene of this movie. It's kind of impossible to talk about the conversation without talking about Gene Hackman because I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, the writing and the directing you can discuss as well, but in terms of acting, what is there else? I mean, you can talk about everyone else in it, mm. um, but I do think it's 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 Gene Hackman's show. And I'm not 100%. too, and I'm not too, um, uh, I don't have masses of knowledge of Hackman in terms no, of I his don't. acting. No, I wasn't really familiar with him. And I, all I, well, me being a massive dark, I just knew him as, he's Lex Luthor to Christopher Reeves. That's, that's what, it, that's, that's what right. he is to me. And then also he's in Bonnie and Clyde, which I studied for A level or whatever. Oh, he is in Bonnie and Clyde as well. Yeah, because he's the he's the really annoying lady's husband who won Best Supporting Actress for some reason. Yeah, that's confusing. Yeah, I don't get it. I have thoughts about Bonnie and Clyde, which I mean, we can get into it another. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll watch it at some point. This is the second week in the row where we meant that we brought Bonnie and Clyde's being brought up. We talked about yeah. the Godfather. Oh one. yeah, because yeah, because of yeah, thingy. Because of Spoilers the thing. for that episode. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but um. Yeah, apart from the acting, the one another thing that I noticed again within this, mm-hmm. in terms of a positive, the sound design is amazing. Yeah, it's really good. I, I, the bit at the beginning was kind of weird at first because I was like, "Why is the audio?" I thought the version that I had that I was watching was like dodgy or something, or like yeah, yeah, my yeah. laptop was being weird. But no, it was like it's a it's a choice for when because it's for when they're surveying people. Sometimes the signal isn't as strong or whatever, and it starts to go like the audio itself goes really weird. Mm-hmm. Really nice touch. When I realised what it was, nice touch. Before yeah. that, it was a bit jarring, but yeah. once you settle into it, and you realise what it means. But even the sound design of when they're going through in that opening scene of when they're going, when you're seeing another couple talking, and then they move, and then you, then yeah. audio, then their audio fades out, and then another couple's audio fades in. And then their audio fades out, and then the couple's audio fades in. I, that, yeah. that was the thing that I noticed. I was like, "God, that's so good." Yeah, it's just so I made good. a I made a note about the uh, about one of the couple's conversations. Oh uh, yeah, and what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and there's a ah uh, like, and of course, sound is a big part of this film anyway because he's a surveillance surveillance guy. guy. Yeah. So of course, sound almost has to be exceptional within the film itself. And there's just so many examples of like, and there's a moment towards the end, which again is a, I'm not going to get into, but it involves uh, a hotel room. And there's, yeah. and there's a bit of audio in that, which is amazingly done, I mm. think. And it really plays with the paranoia, which I think that's like the yeah. main, that's the main word that you could use to describe this film. It's paranoia. I think yeah. that I've noted it down that, um, I, it might well. I haven't actually noted it down on here, but I've thought about it in my mind that it's almost kind of like real window, to an extent, in mm. the way that it's got a character who gets obsessed with a certain thing and then really getting involved with what's happening, and I think that that's like, and that I don't know how much I don't know if Hitchcock played that much of an influence on this film in particular because. Uh, nothing was said in the trivia that I saw, but yeah. I would I wouldn't be surprised if Coppola was like, th- like was inspired by Hitchcock within this film because you could totally yeah. ima- you could totally imagine twenty years if this film was made twenty years ago and Hitchcock did it, I you could see like Jimmy Stewart in the lead and like hundred percent yeah and, yeah and you can take the script and give it a Hitchcock and it's a total Hitchcockian tale yeah hundred percent like you. Yeah, I was yeah, I didn't even think about that. But since you've said it, yeah, it's very much like a who, not a who done it, but kind of like a really old school, simple mystery tale. But it just plays with this one specific character and him kind of losing his mind a little bit. Yeah, it's like like Vertigo. It's like Vertigo, yeah. like, yeah, yeah. like that type of stuff. And it's very much it is an old school story, but with very seventies filmmaking. It's, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, it's it's almost like it's in kind of the equivalent because of like uh, you've seen Gone Girl, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Like I've always thought of Gone Girl as a Hitchcockian film, but made mm-hmm. in the 2010s. It's almost I think that it's almost the equivalent of that. Where the conversation is a very Hitchcockian film. That yeah, is but very much so with 
that era of filmmaking. Um, but yeah, I think that again, the sound design is absolutely fantastic, and of course, it plays it plays wonderfully with the fact that he's a surveillance um, officer mm-hmm. in there. Um, I have also another positive that I have to say is once again. I'm talking about a Francis Ford Coppola film and I'm praising the cinematography in this. Yeah. Uh, like, I didn't notice how... I, I didn't notice how many shots stood out to me until I watched them again. Again, mm. the opening shot is incredible. Yeah, it's really good. I love it, where it's like, it's the big the big aerial view and you zoom in on the mime and then you're following the yeah. mime... And then once the mime passes, that's when you see Gene H- Harry call, and then we we're locked on Harry now. Yeah, like I love that. And again, I'm not going to spoil it, but we can d- we will discuss it later. The ending shot is one of my favorite endings ever. Yeah, like, and that's an incredible shot. There's there's loads of specific shots that really do stand out to me. And again, and it's a different cinematographer to the one in The Godfather, but. Uh, I think the lighting is pretty much like I think the light it is, is pretty flawless. It, it's it, it's fantastic light. We were talking about lighting last week and how much we yeah. absolutely hate it. From from exp- it's the worst thing in the world. It's all for anyone who makes movies. It's it's horrendous. I hate it. Yeah. We all feel your pain if you're a gaffer. Oh God, God bless you. God bless. God you. bless you. But it, yeah, but the lighting in the conversation. It's like when it's daytime. It's it's it looks all very nice and natural yeah and and when it's and when we're in dark rooms it's got that nice gloominess to it but also it's not hard shadows either but there's i don't know no, it's a nice little edge light kind of thing to it yeah there's a, there's a nice little fill to the whole to the whole thing it's never too dark like um like in the godfather sometimes with mm-hmm. um marlon brando's office is kind of a bit ridiculously dark at times yeah it's never like that but it's it's just atmospheric it's yes. it's well used to create a really nice atmosphere for the whole thing yes definitely definitely um any more positives you want to throw out there robbie spoil um, free it's not really a positive or a negative and i don't really know where to where to put this in the podcast so i'll just say it now but the whole time I was watching this film, it was, I say the whole time, about halfway through, I, th- I just thought to myself, I was thinking, well, this seems like a film and a story that is just ripe for a modern remake. Oh, like, yeah. Has that happened? Or is it like... Because th- it, oh. it, it, it'd baffle me if it hadn't, because it's one of, it's like entirely surrounding paranoia towards technology and all that kind of stuff. Like, it just seems like it's like... That's got to have been remade in this modern age. Uh, there is a 2018 film called The Conversation. I'm not sure if it's... Right. Ba- it's It doesn't say it's based off Coppola's script, but uh, the next undercover operator finds himself on the run from his former... It, no, it doesn't sound no. like... No, it's... But just, but, yeah, I just think it's like one of those films where I'll, I'll, I'd be surprised if it wasn't ever redone. Mm. I don't. I don't think if it was redone, it'd be anywhere near as good as this. No, this it, it's it's like a really meticulously well crafted film. Yeah, I'm just surprised that with with the themes that it that it explores, you kind of it's quite you know it's quite relevant. <laughs> still, yeah, no, definitely. Even now, especially with all the Facebook stuff that happened a few years ago. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Like, it seems, it's really relevant to this modern day, which, like, so, some old movies you go back and you watch them and you think, this is really, really great, but it's kind of, I'm not really connecting with it very much because, you know, there's nothing in it that yeah. reflects onto my life and how I've lived and all that kind of stuff. This really will resonate with people, even now. I, oh. I, I, ju- I think so. Oh, I can, I can totally agree with that. And I do think it's not... Because a lot of people get turned off by older films because like, oh, it looks old. But yeah. I don't even think that this has an old look to it. No, it doesn't at all. Like, it, it's, it's got a really nice polished look. The cinematography, I think, is innovative enough to where there's certain stuff in this that really gets you thinking like how the fuck did they do that even today oh yeah and yeah yeah like the aerial shot's the big one for me i mean it's probably just a helicopter with a massive zoom lens but yeah but, but like the 
the um, one thing that would stand out for me for that shot would be the blocking of it. Yeah, yeah. How, how do you do that? The the mime, which I found really funny because he's just kind of being a prick and annoying people. Yeah, yeah. Which is always good. Let people get on with their day, mimes. <laughs> Stop doing it, right? But, like, how would you plan that? Because each one of those people isn't just someone walking past in the street. They'll be extras. Mm. Yeah. So that's mental to me. I don't understand large scale shots like that. They blow my mind. That terrifies me to think about how it <laughs> yeah. got directed. I was like, what? What happened there? Like, how yeah. did that get done? But I think like because I always they get the end of the film. Like I, like after like when I first watched the film, the end shot was always the one that stood out to me. And then when I hit play on my Blu-ray last night. And then mm. I saw the opening, and I just it, it I just remembered. I'm, oh my god, yeah, this is I forgot the opening. Yeah, it's really a film that is truly bookended by two memorable shots at beginning and end. And I don't think yeah. of any, I can't think of many films that have as effective of a beginning shot as an end shot, or vice versa. I no. don't, I don't think maybe uh, maybe the first Godfather. I think that has like two very I, the the close up on um. Uh, the guy at the beginning and at the end where the door shuts. So I think that... Yeah. I mean, Coppola... I, I can't remember the endings of The Godfather Part 2 or Apocalypse Now, but uh, from so far from what... From these two, I mean, he's pretty much smashed it, he? I mean, Coppola is really good at, like, composing shots. And again, these are two different... I mean, he's not the cinematographer, but these are two different cinematographers that he's worked with. Yeah. And he's so... So it's clearly something to do with Coppola's storyboard and all, like, communication mm. with with the cinematographer and i i don't know i just like really i think it's an innovative enough look to it and it's a relevant enough story like you said and i think a lot of stuff involving harry cole's character is even relevant in today's um world i genuinely feel like yeah like it really yeah yeah if anything it's kind of more relevant now than it was 20 years ago oh yeah i think at least with the rise of technology nowadays, 100%. Yeah, definitely. And, I mean, I think any more positives will involve spoilers, so... Yeah, same. Are there any negatives that you have to say, Robbie? Um, There's only one. Is mm. it spoiler-free? It's... Yeah, I, I, I can talk about it just generally. Mm-hmm. To, to explain why it's a negative, I'll have to go into spoilers. So, just generally, um, to, to give something to this portion of the show... I don't like the ending. Oh, really? Interesting. I, I really don't like the ending. Okay. And I, I'll talk about why when we get to spoilers, but yeah, I just, it kind of felt a bit redundant to me. Okay. Okay. But I might have to watch it again. <laughs> okay. No, that's fair. Um, I, I'll, off the top of my head, I can't necessarily think of any negatives. That doesn't mean I think no. it's a, I don't, that's not, that, I don't think that it means it's a perfect film. Because again, as, huh. I, as I said last week, there's no such, no thing, such thing. There's no yeah. such thing. But in terms of my own personal enjoyment and what I've gained from the film, I can't think of any real negatives to it. I think it's a, I think it's exactly as long as it needs to be. It's an hour four. Oh, yeah. It's an hour forty-ish. An hour fifty. I think. Hour fifty. I think it was hour fifty-three. The one. That yeah, I yeah. 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 About that. Yeah. So it's. The, the the length of it is brilliant. I think the pacing is excellent. I, th- I can't think of anything. Oh, yeah, it doesn't slow down at any point. And There's it's... no point where you're like, this is dragging a little bit. No, and what's amazing is that it's not really an action-packed film. There's oh, no... God, not at all. It's, it's, it's quite slow in the sense of it's just a guy just doing little things, but... Yeah. The, but as I was watching it, I was remembering scenes. I was like, oh, yeah, that scene. I love mm. that bit, and then I and then I remember the next bit, and then I was like, "Oh yeah, that bit." Like, <laughs> I think that it, it, it's a film that makes something. Ki- I mean, it's not a mundane thing because it's quite, you know, it's it's not an everyday thing that happens here. But oh, it, yeah. it's nothing that you like. Harry Cole is a character that in today's world will get um, put as like, oh the. The the side character like um I haven't seen mm. the film but like Kevin Smith and Die Hard Four like that's that. yeah like yeah, you, yeah. you know the guy it's like oh we need a thing doing let's go to this guy and then he's in it for like ten minutes that's what like yeah yeah no one's making films of that character now no like the tech expert in a heist film yeah yeah the, and the that's... movie's not about the tech expert is it it's about 
I don't know, George Clooney or whatever. Yeah, I, I, my <laughs> thought, my thought went to Vin Diesel. So we were thinking of completely oh, really? different. <laughs> 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 uh, but one thing I want to um, mention, if I can find it in the trivia bit, which I do. F- no, you know, what? I'll leave it to the trivia. I'll let you wait because uh, I oh, don't want to mess Jesus. it all up. Jesus, I'm but on the edge of my seat. It- <laughs> <laughs> But um, in terms of... Right, so I think with that being said, we should lead into our spoiler discussion yeah. with it. Cool. So if you haven't seen the conversation, wrapping up thoughts of the film, I think it's a excellent film. I think it's highly underappreciated. I think it's recently starting to get a lot of love, at least among cinephiles. I'm hearing a lot more like yeah. film fans discuss it a lot more. So I, I, I try to... I'm trying to... I try to... I like to try to think of a current day film that I can maybe compare it to like I did last week I said if you like The Irishman you might like The Godfather I can't yeah. you know what I can't really think of anything to really compare this film to um yeah it, it's a very unique thing it's got like this unique feeling to it or, so I can't yeah. even like say oh it feels like this film it kind of like I don't know it's when it's I think, a weird one yeah when I uh when I was watching it, I thought right at the beginning, kind of reminded me of Ghostbusters. Hear me out. <laughs> no, no, okay. It was. I can understand. Like the, I can understand. Do you know what I mean? It's the bit. At, it was at the beginning when they're in the van and it's him, yep. Stan and Paul, yep. And it's just the way they're talking to each other. Like there's just these like three kind of blue collar, just regular dudes, yeah. doing a job. Yeah. And it's like the underdogs or whatever. Kind of felt like Ghostbusters to me. And no, then it doesn't for the rest of it. So no. don't listen to that. <laughs> no, it's got like that almost aesthetic minus the, you know. Uh, ghosts and yeah, stuff. Yeah, minus the ghosts. <laughs> yeah, I also want to say, I realised last week I said that, um, I went, oh, it's a really New York-y feat. It's a really, it's a New York type film. It's not, it's San Francisco. But yeah. <laughs> I do, I do think. It feels it, like it though. That's what I mean. It's got, kind of got like yeah. this New York grit to it almost. Yeah. So. There you go. If you like some New Yorky films, you might like this. It's not a New York film. You're not going to see the the, the Statue no. of Liberty, but you know it's kind of got like that. It's interesting because it's kind of a gritty film, but it doesn't feel dirty. No, not at all. It's got like this polish to it, but it's not like it's real world, but it's not like. Oh, everything's so dark and depressing, and, uh, and yeah. look at all the greys and the. Uh, yeah, definitely. I do think it's a, and again, it's not a really. Lo- that's another thing with certain like older films. Usually, they're really long, so it's kind of like. Uh, I mean, do you have like three hours to spare? Uh, yeah. But um, with this one, it's like I genuinely feel like it's an easy enough to watch, easy, easy enough to watch to stick on and get invested. Yeah. Just get. You've got an hour forty-five. Enjoy yourself. Definitely. It's real fun, and it'll make you think. Definitely. You know, if you like, I'd say if you like. Hitchcock movies and you like just thrillers and things generally. Yeah. It's one to watch. Like I'd never heard of it, but it's you know, it's it an underrated gem, I yeah. would say. Yeah. Really good stuff. Almost like those nineties thrillers. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like those like, yeah, that, yeah. those feelings. Yeah, definitely. So and if you're in the UK, um it's available to watch on Now T V. So there you go, you can watch or yeah. you can just buy the Blu ray, you can do what you want. Uh, but I would hi- place, we don't highly recommend the conversation. But if you haven't seen the conversation, leave now because we are going to be discussing our spoiler uh, thoughts on the film. So, yes. Robbie, spoiler discussion, fire away. Okay, so a lot of my uh, spoiler stuff is going to come out of my notes. So I'm just going to read through what I had in my notes. Mm-hmm. Whilst watch- this is notes I made whilst watching the film. The first one was, Harrison Ford is in this? I saw the credit. (laughs) Love that. So, yeah, he is in it, and he's really good. Like, the whole way through. I really like how just kind of weirdly threatening he is. There's a scene near the end. So this is a spoiler to do with Harrison Ford. Like, the, there's the it's not really a spoiler, but just the, the part where Gene Hackman has been in to see the big boss... The director, who Harrison yeah. Ford, yeah, who Harrison Ford is the assistant of. Who, and, there you go. There's my spoiler. Played by go. played by Robert Duvall, which yes, I think is really, go. which I think is really because it's not even like a big reveal. He's just there, and you're kind yeah, of yeah, he's just out like, of nowhere. He's like, there. You're like, <laughs> you're like, wait, is that? It is. 
Because <laughs> he's not even credited. Because it's like even in like in seven when they they hid they hid Kevin Spacey's credit away and they did the big reveal like oh he's the killer and all yeah. that spoiler for seven um, spoiler for seven okay yeah but um but it's not even like that like they didn't have Robert Duvall in the opening credits and he's just there. It's not like, who's the director? Oh, it's Robert Duvall. It's like, yeah, there's the director. He just kind of shows up. Robert Duvall doesn't do a lot in this movie. He just sits at his desk looking angry he and does, pets his he dog. He doesn't have a line. I don't... That I recall. He does. He, I, I know fine well he... I know one line he says, um, count your money outside. Oh, yeah. He, he, yeah. He, he does have a bit of... He does have a bit of dialogue. I, I love that intro scene for him, though, where Gene Hackman is, is talking and he's like, what are you going to do to her? And it, it just like it the the tape perfectly syncs up. I, I, yeah, it's so good. I love it. Yeah, I, I can't remember what the I've, tape said. I've but got it's it. Something about I've got the quote here. Oh. Gene, Gene Hackman goes, "What will you do to her?" And then Robert Duvall's just sitting, looking pissed. And then the audio clip plays. He would kill us if he got the chance. Yeah. Yeah. amazing oh, i love that like, so good yeah i didn't notice it first time but like i legit that's only something that like if you're really into films and stuff that you really pick up on that you yeah. fr- that you almost fan over because i saw it i was like oh that's so good that, that's, that's so amazing. good like God. Well, at the end of that scene when gene hackman's walking out and harrison falls just behind him and gene hackman keeps looking back but he's just staring at him the yeah. whole time uh, it's it's horrifying like i was scared of him and he was the only time I've been scared of Harrison Ford. And he's not imposing; he's just a dude in a no. suit. He's just like the help almost. And he's just but like... it's the look that he gives him is like oh, Jesus dude. Christ. I think that yeah. There's a bit where um, I think it's like when the lift closes, and um, I think some a similar thing. He asks Harrison Ford what's going to happen, and then yeah. he just looks, and as the lift closes, he goes, "You know," and then it yeah. closes, and it's like, "Whoa." It's really oh, good. I love how it's such a... Like, there's so many underlying things of, like, murder and crime and just, like, this... Re- like, yeah. a, a world that would be re- highly sensational, but it you don't see any of that. It's purely hinted upon, which makes that stuff more terrifying, I think. Because you don't actually know what happens. No. I mean, you, you find out at the end what actually went on in the hotel room. I mean, I question if that even really did, like actually happen almost yeah i think like i like is he imagining it because he heard stuff happen because you only see it in flashes in the edit yeah it's only like flashes when gene hackman's thinking about it and all that kind of stuff yeah so you know did it really happen like that or is that just his paranoia yeah and i love going back to the beginning because this is my second note this like plays into kind of the, the whole paranoia and stuff there's a dude at the beginning when the couple when it's going through the couples and what they're saying, and one of the guys in the couples is just like, "Can we go back to yours and have sex? Because I'm bored or whatever." Yeah. Like, he basically just says that, yeah. and it's kind of like I listened to it and was like, "Ew," but it yeah. kind of, like at first you think like, "Shit, if people could pick up on everyone's conversations, I bet people like that are about." And then that kind of gives you the paranoia as well. It it puts it into you straight away because you're thinking like, oh yeah, people, people, I don't know what people are talking about. And I don't know what people are saying when I'm out. That's a very good, that's a very good point. I didn't think about that because they could have very, like the film, mate, like filming, they could have very well have just immediately synced up on the couple. Immediately. They could have immediately. They didn't need to. But they went through different people. So that's almost like, yeah, even if we're not, supposed even if we're not aiming to we could maybe hear your con- like it's yeah it's, anyone it's like people can hear your like most intimate conversations with people that you're most intimate with mental. which is horrifying no that's terrifying and what's interesting in the a bit of the trivia that i've got here was that apparently it was originally envisioned as a horror movie with marlon brando like a, a, the original uh, in the gene in the gene hackman role yeah 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 like, right, that's in, cool. Like, in that's... the early um, thought process of this film, because this film was... Bef- Coppola wanted to do this film before The Godfather. He was sitting on the script for a while, and he really right. wanted to do this film. And I've, I, I, I'll read, more of the, read it more in depth in the trivia. But basically, the only reason why this film got the funding that it did was because of the success of The Godfather. So he, The Godfather yeah. did so well, so then Coppola could finally do this film. 
Yeah, and which, I'm glad he did. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that's really interesting, like, was because it is, it is almost a very. That's one thing I never noticed within my second rewatch. It is a terrifying film, but it's yeah, not, it really is. But and you know, and the fact that it, this could be twisted into a horror script and there are a few horror elements in it like there's that one bit where he turns in the balcony and then the bloody handprint or something just comes oh, yeah with the sound thing that, easily which which that sound it, it can go from it it starts off sounding like a scream but then doesn't it like go into almost like an audio like frequency yeah. type of thing which i think is a really yeah, clever yeah. sound i'm not sure if that was like someone scream and then they altered it to make it like like that, static sort of at yeah the end, but yeah. i thought that was really cool and I, I i forgot and i jumped I'm, I'm not gonna lie i jumped at that but i was like oh yeah i did yeah. <laughs> i was like oh no i've got my next no so okay some of these we don't have to dwell on i'll no yeah we'll talk about them as as i go i'll just start rattling them off what's with this weird audio was a note that i made and then i realized so we don't need to talk about that mm-hmm. <laughs> so then i thought this man looks like a chubby joseph gordon levitt which is who the guy... A, who are we on about there? The guy, sir, I'm pretty sure I'm on about the dude who... Who is the, the like, boyfriend. Like, the secret boyfriend of the lady. Oh, the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I just kind of thought he looked like a chubby Joseph gordon Levitt, apparently. So okay. that's some of that I wrote down. Um, and then it's... Robbie Wow. Al- Al- <laughs> it's Big Forehead Man. Was a note in there. When I realised that it was him. Um, then I've got, I like Harry, so that's good. And then I've made a pun to myself, because it's the bit when he's in the when he's on a, in a phone booth. Oh, yeah. Which, I love that shot as well. There's, again, it, I, looks, it looks so, that shot is amazing. With the neon light behind him. Yeah. Oh, do you know? Do, do you know a film that I thought, I mean, it's too late now, we're in the spoiler section, but do you know a film that I thought about that could act, uh, drive? Yeah, the Ryan Gosling one. Yeah, that could like it. It's all yeah. it, cause it. I yeah, I didn't I? Literally, you said the neon light, and then I thought about that, and I thought this it kind of does have a bit of driveness to it in a sense. Yeah, I could say that. But, yeah, but yeah, no, but yeah, that shot in the phone booth is oh god, you're gonna you're gonna be listing loads of scenes, and I'm gonna just keep saying that shot, that shot, that shot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's uh. But I put I, I wrote down ha, it's Mr. Carl on a call. Which isn't funny. Fuck's sake. So, <laughs> moving on. Um, I wrote, I'm intrigued into this plot because it just keeps creating questions. Yes. Which it really does. Because you, so you start off and you're thinking, what, what is this going to end? You, you focus on Gene Hackman mm-hmm. and you think, what is this dude about? What's he doing? Mm-hmm. And then you, you move past him and go to these different people and then you end on that couple. Yes. And you listen to their conversation and the way it's framed, you know that it's people watching them. And then you're thinking, why are they watching them? Why mm-hmm. are they following these people specifically? Mm-hmm. What about this conversation is so important? Yeah. Then you realize what they're doing and you think, oh, they're surveillance people then. Who are they doing this for? Mm-hmm. And you find that out. And then you realize that you don't, you see how paranoid Gene Hackman is. The, the questions start rising when, Harrison Ford tries to like take the photos and then he goes, No, yeah. I, no, no, I want to give it to the director. It's like, well, no, that's not necessary. Yeah. He goes, no. And then he goes in the lift. And I love that shot where he feels quite it's like he feels very it is almost like kind of like a really slow horror scene of like he, he walks mm. to the lift and then Harrison Ford like follows him but like on the other side and then he's down the hallway and then Harrison Ford's like waving the money. And like the envelope yeah. or something, and then like, and then he walks into the lift, and Harrison Ford just shakes his head, and then there's that shot of like the lift's just about closed, and you see Harrison Ford like peeping over almost, of like yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then and then that scene, and then the lift doors open, and then more people start coming in the lift, and I'm like, that's like a beautiful. I mean, it's a obvious um, reference to the fact of the claustrophobia and like how like he's feeling quite like all of a sudden. At, trapped like, yeah like, unease and then you notice that's the girl yeah and then you're like and then you think oh so she why is he investigating here. her then and then she leaves and then the bloke comes in as well yeah and it's like oh they work here why are they under investigation yeah. then and then cause, yeah because i forgot about like the actual reasoning behind it all and my thought was like oh 
they're a couple who work in there. Are they, like, I don't know, maybe not meant to be? Are they meant to just purely be work colleagues? Like, what's the deal yeah. here? But, I mean, they are. But the thing is, oh, she's the wife of the, the head director yeah, guy. the director guy, yeah. Which I think is revealed... That's only... Is that... That's only revealed... Right I mean, at the very end. That's only revealed once Robert Duvall is shown, I think, because that's when you see photo, yeah, yeah. photos of her. And that's when it all clicks and you go, oh, right. Yeah, because it, it's it's when she's walking out. It's after it's after the death scene in the hotel room because you don't know who died. And then it shows her coming down the stairs in the building and all these news reporters coming to her and being like, all this. And then one of them asks, did you know, did you know that your husband has a history of drunk driving or something like that? And then it flashes the foot of them two together, and that's when it clicked. Well, no, because there's some. It's when um, for me anyway. Uh, well, I notice it because it's like um, there's uh, when Gene Hackman goes to give the photos to Robert Duvall. That's when you see photo. Mm. I, you see photos of her on his desk, and right. like, photos of them two. I didn't notice that. Were you doing your notes? I did not notice that were, at were all. You, were, you, were you writing your notes at this time? <laughs> probably, yeah, probably, probably yeah. Probably going, holy shit, it's Robert Duvall. Yeah, yeah. And then, cause then that, cause that's why Gene Hackman then asks, um, what are you going to do to her? Not, yeah. Not yeah. to them, to her. But like that, and then yeah, that's, that's another, in, that's another fascinating thing when he's like, first like mixing with the audio, he's trying to make it all clear and all that, which apparently that whole mm. technology is legitimate. I think they got an actual surveillance officer to be a consultant on the film to make sure everything yeah, is legit, I could see that. legitimate. And then he's like, there's that one bit that cuts out where you go, raw, 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 raw. and then she says yeah. something. And then I, I remember I was like doing this. I was like leaning in. I was like, what's. What did it was he say? <laughs> and, then he, and he's trying to make it clearer, and he's doing all this. Yeah. Sh- and then it's like, and it's beautiful because and again another film would be building up the score, building up the score, building up the score. He kills if he has the chance. Dun, 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 and you know they would. Yeah, yeah. But it's so beautiful where it just it goes it's silent. Really subtle. It goes proper muffled, like it lowers mm. down, and then you like the background, and then you just hear. He kills if he has the chance, and then that instantly gives you a thing of like, who's gonna kill them? Why are they at? Why are they being targeted? Yeah. And then that, uh, it, it, it legit. And then again, as you said, that's more questions, and then it starts piling up of like, why does the director maybe want to kill them? Yeah. And then ah, oh, it's mental. It's crazy. But again, I, I re- love, I love the reveal how it literally is they will have an affair. I love things like that in films where it's like this, these big high stakes things and it's all about something mm. that just happens. It's not a thing of like, yeah. oh, they stole the money and they're going to start their own. It, nothing like this big like movie. Yeah, it's like she's trying, to get the, she's trying to get the company for her own and get the stocks or whatever. It's not that. Yeah, it's like they have an affair and they're bricking themselves that. It's like, shit, 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 shit. What will happen? Yeah. What will happen? What will happen? And it's... Oh, I love that, yeah. I love the point as well. I've made a note here. Um, I started the scene. It's the bit where he goes to talk to that woman um, who he's been, who Gene Hackman's been seeing yes. secretly, even though he hasn't got a wife. Yeah, yeah. Which is really, that's interesting on its own. But I wrote um, Gene Shagman, but then that's not very funny. So I also then I thought, um, so she says, um, sometimes I think maybe you're listening to my phone calls mm. to Gene Hackman. And it was at that, that moment that you just instantly stopped trusting him. Yeah. Because you think to yourself, you think, oh, he probably is. Yeah. Oh, oh no, he probably is. Because yeah. it's so, that's so well done. Because it, it's at that point when you think to yourself, like, uh, up to that point, you, you know, he's kind of a mysterious guy and you, you can tell just from the performance that he keeps himself to himself and it's all that kind sti- of stuff. It's still in the first act because before then... Yeah, it's, it, in the, it's within the first 25 minutes. Yeah, and it's like, that's also like the scene that comes after when he gets the birthday card and we see him in his apartment for the first time. And Yeah, and he's like shouting. He's not shouting at the person down the phone, but you can tell he's like... He's, he's, he's angry that he got given something to his apartment. That's, you know, and that's, um, and but, that's one thing that I loved, right? Because, and I noted it down here where um, I can't find it exactly. Um, I, there's always a sense of mystery with Harry, like his age. Like you never find oh, yeah. out f- what, like there's always like this, like you, you never know exactly what's up with him. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's, there's a bit, 
in the film that which we can discuss a bit later on, which I do want to talk about, where he's almost in a dream. Where he's in a dream. Yeah. And, he, and, and that's when you, you learn a bit more about him through there. Um, a little bit. But even then, you well, don't... you like... never find out masses. You no. really don't. He, he just... It's at that point when she's asking him these questions and he gets really annoyed and stands up and he says, like, I don't want to answer any more questions. Yes. And he goes to leave. The, you realise, like... Oh, I thought... Because with the bit with the with the birthday present, I, am, I thought, oh, he's just a really paranoid guy, which plays into the surveillance aspect of things. But you at that point, when he just refuses to ask, answer any questions anymore... Think, I probably shouldn't trust this guy. Mm. Like it, it's a it's a protagonist that you you really shouldn't trust because when it, like like I said when she says, um, uh, sometimes I think maybe you're listening to my call. You think, well, yeah, he, he probably is. Yeah, because he can. I and I and I do and I love the dialogue between just everyone in this film. It's so real and it's so yeah. like, like there's and it, and everyone all the people in it. They're not characters of things. They are people. Like I like they're not yeah. like Gene Hack like Harry Cole isn't a complete good guy, but he's not a complete asshole. Stan isn't a a bitch and he's not No, exactly. He's not a bitch, but he's also not a stand up guy. Bernie's not a scumbag, but he's also not really he's like a, he's a bit of a swindler, but he's not exactly a horrible blow. Yeah, and the girl and the girlfriend, she's not I mean, she could have very well have been I forgot her name. I love the film and I can't remember her name. Um, Bruce Willis's girlfriend in Pulp Fiction. She could have very well have been that type of character. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, like, she could be very well have been naive, the uh, airhead, but she, yeah. I, I forgot the exact line she says to him. I forgot what she says before he leaves, but I think she says, um, I, some along lines of like, when you open the door, when you, when you came to the door, I, my feet were dancing under the covers. I was so happy. But I yeah. also can't keep doing this, which is so. Yeah, she's like, I can't stop waiting around for you. Which I look, I, and I love that. Like, it's so like it's clearly shown. Like, yeah, she, she she's really happy when around him. I don't think she yeah. loves him. I don't think she loves him. But I think she's clearly like no. Like there's some like she clearly feels there's a connection there. But she's also not a complete idiot. Where it's like you're clearly not into this. So can you just like make yeah. up your mind like i love that bit as well because it literally is like she and you can tell like she's trying to get to know him she's like i didn't know it was your birthday he goes yeah well yeah. and then she she is asking these questions he's like why and she's like well but it's not like obscure questions either it's no, things that someone if you're if you're meant to be like kind of in a relationship but not really but it's still things that you should probably know just yeah. like how old are you she doesn't know <laughs> yeah wait, wait i didn't she know it was your know birthday. His birthday yeah yeah. yeah, and it's the it's it's the bit where you, where you don't really find out how old he is because the, it's on the phone. He says, "How old do you think I am?" And he goes, "Oh, forty-four. Yeah, that's a pretty good guess." Yeah, yeah. And then later on, he says he's forty-two. But is he? But but is he exactly? Because yeah. his his character is built up so much to a point where you think, well, is anything that he's saying actually real, or is he trying to defer people because he's paranoid about whether people will be tapping into him and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But going going more into that, like the things that you find out about his character, the writing's so good, and the scene that like, it's like little tidbits throughout the movie where you found more and more out about him. And one of a really good scene of that to me is when him and Stan have the argument. Oh, I love that in thing, the office. Yeah. It's really it's great, and you find out that he's like quite devout Christian. I've got it here. He doesn't. Yeah, I've got it here saying Harry's reveal of being religious is beautifully show and not tell. Yeah, like it, because it's just Stan says Jesus or he says like Christ or something like that. Yeah, and and Harry just really calmly goes like, "Don't say that. I don't like that." Yeah, and then he does it again, and then he get he really loses his rag about it. Yeah, he goes, "Don't use that name in vain." Yeah, uh, it, but yeah, and and then he goes to church, and you see him. He goes to church, and he asks to be resolved of his yeah. sins. And then, of course, at the very end, where he's wrecking shit, which we can have a sole discussion about the ending, because I think that's worth yeah. talking about. Um, I think that scene alone is worth like just waiting to really talk about that. But the bit mm. where he like he doesn't quite go to the Virgin Mary, like yeah. immediately, and then he looks and he goes, "I have to now." And then yeah, so, exactly. So part of me is I, don't, I 
I don't know if there's any like mother issues that there with him. Within, I mean, he references his mother. Yeah. In that dream sequence, he, yeah. he talks about his mum. Yeah. And like bathing him and and putting uh, holy oil on him specifically. Yeah, yeah. And there's a very and there's an interesting thing. I I want to read this bit here. Um, um, it's a trivia, but it's relevant in terms of talking about like specific things. Um, Gene Hackman's character was to have been named Harry Call, sp- spelt C A L L, but a typing mm. error. But a typing error led to his being named Harry Call, spelled C A U L, um, <laughs> and the name stuck because Coppola liked how the meaning of the word Call a birth defect causing a membrane to surround the head related to the character. Uh, the meaning of Harry's last name, Call, is a fetal membrane sometimes present at birth. This ties in strongly with both Harry's transparent rain jacket, which he wears for the majority of the film, and also mm-hmm. the fact that Harry is occasionally viewed through a translucent sheet of plastic when threatened, such as by his rival during the party scene. That's really interesting. Yeah. That's something I wouldn't have noticed at all. Obviously, I mean, I don't have any idea about fetal membranes. No, neither do but I. But <laughs> even like seeing him through plastic sheets and stuff, I wouldn't have even clocked that properly. Yeah, so I don't know if, like, it, the, again, a fetal membrane. So it's almost like, I don't know, there's something about, like, um, I think he's he's very questioning of whether he was meant to exist anyway. Uh, yeah, I think you you get that in that dream scene, and I, definitely. I want to specifically point out that bit of the dream scene, then we can go back to talking about uh, another bit there. But one one of my fa- uh, that's one of my favorite scenes because that's the one bit where he just talks about what like himself, himself. yeah. And of course, it's yeah. in a it's in a dream sequence thing. Mm. And and again, this is this is a total Oscar W. Fitchett scene. I think I looked at it. I was like, why does this feel something that I would have written? <laughs> Oh like, uh, yeah, not as hundred, a hundred percent. Not as cleverly, I don't think. But I was looking at, it, I'm like, that's. I mean, that may as well have just been a muse scene. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I thought of when I was watching it? Because what? you, the the they do the thing for like, oh, it's a dream. As in, there's like loads of fog and mist yeah. and stuff, and I was expecting the bloody unicorn from Blade Runner to come tumbling through. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, you know. Ridley Scott went to the Francis Ford Coppola school of dream sequences, I guess. I I, I, I kind of like, every time I see like a fog scene, I just, because all I know now is like how fog things are done. So I'm just imagining a dude just like yeah. walking, just, <laughs> just Lee. Just Lee. <laughs> God, just Lee with a fog machine. But the, but in that bit, there's a specific, I, um, I, I'm paraphrasing it. I'm not exactly saying the exact words here, but, yeah. um, he says, um, I was just, um, it's when he said he slipped down in the bath. Yeah. And then he woke up, um, that he, and then he woke up with, uh, getting holy water put on him, I think, cause, or like getting something put on him because of the, uh, yeah. the burns. Yeah. And, holy oil, he says. Yeah. And he said, and again, I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically says, I was disappointed that I was, that I was still alive. Yeah. He says some which I love. Ah, I don't know. And there's a specific other bit there, which um, I think it's when he's talking to the lass that he kind of has a bit of a thing for at the party. It's when mm. he's starting yeah. to settle down in bed, and he and this this I'm um, quote and he goes, "I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of murder." Yeah, that's so good. Which I mean, I seeing that line, I was like. I think I relate to that so much because again, I'm not. I, I the same. I'm not afraid of dying. It's the fact of being of murder can happen. Not even necessarily to me, yeah. but I mean the fact that that's a thing. That that's terrifying. The fear that it can happen to people is really weird. Yeah, and I and, no. and I think that says a lot about him. Why he's so invested? It's like because you can look at like why is he bothered about these two? He could just simply just give the photos and he'd be like, yeah, I got my payday. See you later. Yeah. Like he doesn't, he's not, he's got no investment. Why should he be invested? Like what does he have? What does he have 
to do with any of these but the fact he's like i'm not afraid of death i'm afraid of murder it's the fact that i don't know like i like that that's the quote that i like walked away from that film like really like yeah i think it kind of sums up it sums up his kind of thoughts throughout the story really yes definitely really well it, it it sums up his thing he's not he's not doing this because he's fearful for his own life Mm. he's scared at what the work that he does leads to exactly it's it's what he's causing yeah yeah no it's yeah, guilt definitely. more than anything yeah is what he's feeling but just to go on to a uh, another scene mm-hmm. uh there's there's two things that i want to talk this is just kind of an offhanded thing that i i loved the bit where that guy rings in about a specific guy's number plate who's drag racing and then he lists off all the stats about that dude, and then basically just calls him a twat and tells him to leave. <laughs> I can't remember that. He like so it's um it's that Paul dude who's a police officer, mm-hmm. and they're they're driving and it's to, they're when they're driving to the party, and there's like a guy that's like speeding past him and like oh, yeah. racing through the streets and stuff, and he calls the guy like calls in about the number plate of that car and gets all the details about the guy driving. And then when they pull up at a light, he's like. You're five foot ten, you live at this address, your name is this, also you're a dick. And then he just drives <laughs> off. It's great. I love that. I love, again, Ir- irrelevant to anything, but I just really liked it. Again, <laughs> that's another thing I've noticed. Copeland knows how to really insert humour into kind of heavy films. Yeah, he really and does, yeah. It's the bit as well, like, it, towards the beginning in the van where the girls are like, fixing their makeup and just stands just yeah. like, go on, a little bit of tongue go on just a little bit of tongue go yeah. on and then and then harry's like stan can you not <laughs> it sets it sets his character up very well of being kind of a sleazy dude as yeah well. yeah yeah it's just really good it's really good like comedy for the sake of character kind yeah. of stuff yeah no definitely. He's, he's really good at that but the scene that i wanted to talk about before we get on to talk about the ending, and there's one specific shot that has stuck with me that I want to talk about as well. I've got a few. But, I've got a few additional notes as well. So yeah, yeah. just the um, the scene where him and Bernie are talking uh, mm. at the party, mm. and he's saying about how he wants to be partners and stuff. And it's the the moment he re- the moment Bernie reveals that he's had Harry bugged is incredible i knew that i knew as soon as he gave it's I, I, so good yeah i knew it as well like as soon as like he popped the pen in him i thought to myself that's mic'd like i i thought that like that's my, and i forgot Just, about it until he whipped out the tape record i was like it's the pen it's the pen yeah it's so good oh. he just he just whips it out and is like and he presses play and it reveals it's and it goes back to that fear at the beginning about people recording your most intimate moments because it's, it's the recording that he presses play on is the intimate moment he was having with that girl beforehand, it's, asking her about if someone would love him. Yep. It's so good. It's the one... Like, it's, it's such the, good writing. It's the one time he's like, right, I'm, now, I'm away from everyone else. I'm with this girl. I'm feeling a bit yeah. of a thing. I'm, I'm feeling... Uh, there's, there's some sort of connection there. And let me try this. And, yeah. the, and the, the amazing camera and Edison work there where it like starts on her, then it like pans round to him. And then it basically yeah. resets and then pan. I, I I kept watching. I was like, it's kind of dizzying, but it works really well. It it goes from oh, yeah. it goes from dizzying to almost kind of like floaty. Like you're kind of like ah, like, like yeah. You know, oh yeah. Like you kind of because think... you could kind of look at that in the sense like he might be starting to feel a bit like like dizzy in the sense like oh what am I doing here? Why am I? Oh I'm nervous. Oh, blah blah. Any dude can maybe relate to any girl that they if they're talking to any girl they find attractive. Just one to one, you could be like oh no. <laughs> That's yeah. And then once you get in the mo- and then once you know he's seeing that she's like interested in him talking and he's yeah feeling comfortable. Then the feeling the exact same shot goes from feeling dizzy into feeling like you're on some sort of euphoria. And you're like, yeah, oh, like whimsical is... sort of thing. Yeah, 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 and I love that bit. And again, like, and then that's the moment where he kind of feels like I relate that feeling of like the feeling I get from watching that scene of like when he's talking to her and then like uh, stands Ryan on the scooter, which is brilliant. And then like Bernie's there as well, like, hey, mm. and they just have a bit of. I relate to that feeling to a feeling that I get for most of Days to Confused for some re- of like the feeling of, yeah. of like ah, like ah, just like. Ah, like just fun, just like being a yeah. just social fun. Like that's that one moment there, and again it is. A, and then that's the one. 
part of the scene where Harry starts feeling like, yeah, I'm fucking, yeah, I'm, I'm cool. Yeah, so, so this is what I wanted to talk about. It's just the bit where he's like, when he's talked to that girl and after, after he's had the conversation with her, correct me if I'm wrong on the placement of these parts of the scene, but he is, it's then that he does the whole like showing off about how he did that thing in, with the microphones. Yes, because that's the first time. Because cause... that's, because what I find very interesting about that is that he, when he sees Stan working for Bernie, he goes, don't tell him anything about what we do. And then, he, yeah. and then Stan starts saying, hey, look at this map. Look at this. And then, yeah. Har- and then Harry starts going like, yeah, what we did there, we used this microphone. That's like a... S-. And then he starts bragging about his work. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the, it's the one part where after he's talked to that girl and all this... Is when he's like built up this confidence, and it, it it's the first time you ever see him be confident within the whole movie, and then you the screenwriters have got to just remind. It's like they're reminding the character of, oh no, you need st- you still need to be paranoid because as soon as he gets that confidence up, it's ripped away from him again. Yeah, and you by know, Bernie revealing that he's been recorded the whole time. And you know Bernie's it's genius. And you know Bernie's not doing it for a malicious intent. He goes, well, hey, see, see, Harry, I could do it as well. Yeah, it's meant to be like, I duped you. Look, look how I, how good I am. We should have a partnership and all this. Yeah, yeah. It's meant to be jovial and like between friends. Yeah, yeah. But it's such a perfect reminder to that character of just like, you still should be worried. Never yeah. get too confident. Yeah, and he goes, I love it. And he goes, I think you better leave. And then, yeah. and then they're like, Harry, Harry, come on, it's not that big. And he, and he just snaps the pen and he throws it and he just like has this look of like, just, just go. So good. Just go. Uh, it's, it's, it genuinely is a scene. Like, that's another thing with this film. It's so many emotions throughout the whole film. Yeah. Like so many. It's it, And again, yeah, as you said, that scene there. And again, it's perfect ride of the reveal of like he's being recorded. And I genuinely felt like when he whipped the tape out, when Bernie whipped the tape out, my thought was like, oh no. Like, I genuinely felt like yeah. that. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah, no. you're like, oh, no. Because I know how Harry's going to react to it. I know he's going to be like... Yeah, because you've been so enthralled by this character the whole time. Yeah, yeah. That and you're it... just like, you know, it's going to go down. It's yeah. going to be bad. Yeah, and I, and I can relate not to the exact scene itself, but to a feeling of like, you're in a social situation where you're not fully feeling like yeah. settled in there but you kind of go along with the flow you're talking to a few people you end up talking to someone that you're like i oh, know now i feel settled this is cool hey and then you start like getting like, yeah. then you start feeling settled i've never had the thing of like someone whipped mm. a tape recorder out to me and then i'm like come on haha <laughs> i got you yeah i get yeah i haven't had <laughs> I, have, I haven't had gary whip out a phone be like hey oscar see i just recorded you talking to this last time like, that, that, <laughs> that, that hasn't happened um, you just wait till we next go to spoons i'll be i'll be there wait sam whips out a recorder <laughs> yeah sam whips out his task cam that he's had with him the whole time i i oh. I, I break it i think you better leave sam it's... yeah <laughs> Get his road mic and snap it out. Oscar at Spoons, you don't own the I think you, I think you better leave, Sam. Oscar at Spoons. What are you talking about, Oscar? We don't live here. I think you better leave. <laughs> Oscar at Spoons, you don't... It's <laughs> yeah, it's a public space, Oscar. What are you talking about? Anyway, a little... You better bit, go. A little bit of side chat about uni there. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> but yeah, you know, like, it's... It, 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 on, it, it really does relate you to Harry, I think. 100%. And I got yeah. it, and I've got it here as well. I've got a surveillance. It's a surveillance film about isolation. Oh, yeah, it's about yeah, yeah. It's about like how isolated this guy feels, and I love again. There's a bit where you start here. He's in the convention thing, and then people go, "Wait, you're Harry Call," and then that's when it yeah, starts. Yeah, he's being recognized, like, and he's like, "Oh," and then like, and again, Bernie's like, "Wait, Harry." Harry Cole, it's a pleasure. Yeah. And then he's like, oh, he's hot shit. And he's clearly like, not like, he's like, eh, one, eh, whatever. And I've got a note down here, like, Harry is greatly admired, but still not happy in himself. And in brackets, mm. I put her. Because that reminds yeah. me so much of like the- Theodore in her about how like, how when Chris Pratt, Chris Pratt is like, Harry, you're right. Uh, not Harry, don't you? Theo, your writing's mint. Like, oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it like, made me cry. And then yeah. Theo's like, oh, thanks, thanks. Uh, and then he goes home, listens to melancholy songs and cries. And it's like, it's, yeah. al- it's almost like that's like, Harry, your surveillance is mini. He goes, oh, cheers. And he goes home and sadly plays the saxophone. Yeah. Like, <laughs> which I loved, by the way. I love uh, every time he's playing the saxophone. Uh, yeah. But I could, 
it's when whilst watching this movie, just as a, a final thing about Gene Hackman. Yes. Specifically in my experience with the actor and what I've seen him in, which is he's Lex Luthor to me, and he always <laughs> will be Lex Luthor to me. But I can see exactly why he was cast as Lex Luthor from this movie. Oh yeah. As this character who's paranoid because he doesn't trust the people around him. Yes. Because it, but there's like an era of the Lex Luthor kind of he thinks he's more intelligent than everyone. Mm. No, yeah. Like he he knows for a fact that he's more intelligent than the other people in the surveillance game. Oh, you can see it in this you, movie. You can, see and you can see it. You can see it in that party bit where he starts talking about the technology. He goes, "Yeah, this is the thing that I did." And you can see, he knows yeah. it, but he doesn't he, like. He knows that he's clever, but he doesn't. He he, he plays it methodically because he doesn't trust other people. Yes. Yeah. It's it's a really well done and well nuanced performance. I've just. I loved it. You know what? Now that I'm talking about this movie more with you, because I've just been kind of like dwelling it on my thoughts, because I, I only watched it this morning. All right, all right yeah. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> I, it was, I was really struggling to find it. But anyway, I found it this morning, watched it, and now we're talking to you about it more, because I've been out with my friends today and whatever. The more I talk about it, the more I realise I love this film. Yeah, no, it really... It's it, so good. It's, <laughs> it's so layered. There's so many layers. Yeah. Like, you, oh, yeah. you could go into like what Bernie's talking about with Harry. He goes, yeah, what happened in New York? Yeah. And, and he goes, oh, no, nothing. He goes, yeah, well, th- well, this happened. And, then, and I love it's the, just... I love how the camera sticks on Harry as well. You hear mm. him, but you, it, he's just walking. Yeah. Goes, no, no. He, he... I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to have analysed this movie in A-level film studies as opposed to doing Bonnie and Clyde for, like, new Hollywood stuff. Uh, yeah. I'd, have, I'd have loved to have done that. Because we did... Um, for that, this is going to be completely off topic, but for that subject, we did uh, Old Hollywood versus New Hollywood. Yeah. And it was, uh, we did Casablanca mm. and Bonnie and Clyde, and you had to compare them. Well, Bonnie and Clyde I, was the start of New Hollywood, so that's like... Yeah, exactly, yeah. But I think this film has so many of the staples of New Hollywood and the experimental kind of ideas yeah. that were put in place at the beginning of it, that it, it's a really good example of that era of movies but what i think because a lot of people like i mean i fall i fall into this as well a lot of people associate new hollywood with just violent cynical cinema like a lot of people seem to yeah but it's not entirely that no and i think the com as you're saying that the conversation has a lot of new hollywood elements to it but it's not violent nor cynical no i i mean is in just the um just like the filmmaking ideas in it like the new Hollywood to me isn't about the fact that it, oh it became more violent and people could swear and stuff. That's an element. It's, That's an element. It's an element of it. But to me, it's about the filmmaking techniques that people developed. Yeah. Like people started doing steady cam movements. Yeah. And it wasn't just things on a tripod and you filmed for a bit and then did the reverse shot. Yeah. People yeah. were doing camera movements and it got really experimental and got really creative with it. That's mm. what new Hollywood is to me. And I think the conversation is a really really good example of that. No, specifically for. My next point, which is the one specific shot I want to talk about that has stuck with me, because you said about um, the shot that stuck with you. One that stuck with me is the after the um, the it's not the it's not the exact ending, but it's near to the end. The toilet. Oh, are it's, you in the hotel? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's because uh, I saw it. I saw that it was it had loads of water in it, and I thought that's kind of weird. You know, like, I didn't think much of it. And it's a... He flushes, and there's just that top-down view of the toilet. And they cut away... Because the editing's really good in this part as well. But they cut away from it just the split second after you just start to see hair coming up of the plug hole. And you think, like, what? And then it's not hair. It looked like hair anyway at a first glance because it's such a, like, short clip. And then you realise it's not hair, it's blood. Mm -hmm. Because I I don't know if it's... It could have been on purpose. And if it is on purpose, well done to you. But I, my first thought of the whole scene when people, when what was happening in the hotel room, I thought the girl was dead. I thought the girl had been killed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when that he- when that blood came up from the toilet, that looked kind of like hair. I was like, have they like decapitated her and shoved her head in the toilet? Yeah. To hide it. But then it it all turns into blood and then it starts overflowing. And there's blood coming out on the floor and there's a really good shot of Gene Hackman's legs and oh. between his legs is the toilet with the blood coming out. It's really good stuff. It's like that's that's what stuck with me. It's guttural. It's like oh yeah. It's the fir- it's the first time that the film gets almost like 
almost like because that scene in any other that shot in any other film like if it was like in a Dario Argento film like it, mm. or like um, a Sam Raimi picture that's just another shot in one of those types of oh, films yeah. it's a good shot but it's just another one of those shots but yeah, with, yeah. but with the film but with the conversation being what it is which is a steady character piece a shot like that mm. almost makes you go Hoo! like it's almost like yeah it, because it's because violence throughout the movie it's talked about mm. and it's hinted at that something bad is going to happen that's going to be violent it's going to be a horrible act of this murder mm-hmm. but you got there's no blood there's no fighting throughout the entire movie up until and that then hotel there's, and then yeah. there's just that yeah. and it's like oh god it it really hits you it's like a real gut punch when it comes it's so good yeah and th- my first thought when seeing that was like D- is he hallucinated that like, that was my instant thought mm. I'm like is that hallucination like, yeah but like it's like it's that and the bloody handprint on the window is the only um like really like yeah because the the way that you see it happen it can't now that we, we were saying is that actually how it went down it can't be because the way that they showed it was just she got the, like someone came up behind him with like a plastic sheet and suffocated. Uh, for yeah, I, we haven't even spoken about this. It's, yeah. it's the director that gets killed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, but yeah, just to get that out there. But the, the um, I'm pretty sure it was the chubby Joseph Gordon Levitt comes up behind him and suffocates him with a plastic sheet. It, like they like shove him into like a plastic sort of yeah, I, don't, I can't remember sheet thing. And that can't be how it how it actually happened. That has to be what Gene Hackman thinks, because otherwise, where did the bloody handprint come from, and what's the deal with the toilet? Yeah, yeah. Some 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 parts of that have to be not real, because it doesn't line up. Yeah, and I love that. With I love that. Yeah, it's ambiguous, but it's not. It gives you enough. Oh yeah. But yeah, I can see us talking about this film in months' time. Oh, like, definitely. Like, like it's just gonna like pop up in conversation. In conversation. Um, in, in the conversation. <laughs> but yeah, I do. I do think it's. Um, yeah, this and I. I really talking about it with you now. I really need like get the PDF of the script and read the script itself. Oh it's, yeah. Like just talking about it, I didn't. I forgot like how like they like, tight and almost like pitch perfect the 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 writing of this film is. Oh yeah, and, and how and how are certain scenes written? Like, how does Coppola describe things? Like, that's what I'm yeah. interested in. But yeah, yeah, God, yeah, like that. Yeah, no, it's yeah. I definitely. think it's just it's so layered, and just like I honestly, even like I, like I'm saying, I'm liking it even more. Like the more that I talk about it, I cannot wait to watch it again. Yeah, no, yeah. To see what to see what else I get, you know. And I think it's a film that my dad would love. Mm. I'm, I may imagine he's never heard of it. Because yeah. my dad, he likes movies, but he's not, you know... Yeah. He's not one of us, <laughs> is what I say. But, like, yeah, I just... I really loved it. But just to go on to mm-hmm. my main negative, which I said about how I didn't like the ending. So... Are we, are, do you want to go on the ending now, do we? Yeah, unless you've got any other... I've got a few um, more... To go on for. I, I got yeah, a few yeah. more No, points. you go through yours, because I'm done with mine. Um, I got here that camera plays a lot with depth and makes us feel like we're looking amongst a crowd. Yeah. They, and I think, and I know, and I know in my Godfather notes, I said that the film plays a lot with depth, like framing within a frame. Like there's that yeah. scene in the Godfather with um, Luca Brazzi preparing his gun, but he's like through a doorway and then, you know, it's like doing that. And I mean, and the film, yeah. and this film kind of does the same thing, but instead of doorways, it's crowds of people. Like, so, mm-hmm. and I, and I think that, is great it's not just flat it's it, there's always like more layers to it um i've got here that harry's apartment is bare and white which this is me mm. looking at in terms of a mise on sense sense where it's a film where his apartment is not clean it's com- it's bare there's like nothing in it it's almost like he doesn't want anyone it's almost like he doesn't there's few bits and pieces in there but there's like nothing yeah, and it's almost it's got... as if he doesn't trust people to. He doesn't trust to buy even furniture from people. Yeah, yeah, and he's got, and it's like, um, and it's like, and white, which again, I did a lot. I did a bit of color theory when doing stuff for the, the uni film that we yeah. did, and white is very much so. It can be a symbol of purity as well as a symbol of just plainness. 
and just mm. and just emptiness, which I th- which you can look at it. That that more corresponds to yeah. Harry. I'd say it al- yeah. it almost looks like he's trying to find purity because being a religious man. Yeah, but it's almost. Uh, but I just know that down there because that's the first thing I know. I always do that within like now since I've researched mise en scene, I always look at like characters live in areas to see what it's like because that i think that like yeah. that's a perfect that's a brilliant way to tell you exactly about a character without simply just getting told about a character um so i just thought that was really cool i yeah. liked i noted here that the camera in his apartment it's like a big like wide and then it swivels when he sits down and it's almost like a surveillance camera. And there's a spe- and there's yeah. a moment in the end, and that's specifically done like the- it's the end shot where it's specifically yeah the done. final shot where it goes from one room into the other where he's playing yes. a saxophone. Yeah. Yes, and there's a few shots like that where it is very much so like it just s- stays, and then it swivels mm. like a smooth glide to make it look like a CCTV footage. Um, Shout out to the opening art shot, art studio shot in the Muse that Woo! that very few people have seen. <laughs> Shout out to Megan for being real good on the camera for that shot. That was Reese. Was it Reese? The 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 high angle shot. Oh yeah, the high. Sorry, yeah. Not the opening yes. uh, art. I thought you shot. meant the opening opening art. No, nah, that was Megan. That uh, was Megan. Reese did. Big the... ups, Megan and Reese. Yeah. Well done, uh, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that um, I love that there. Harry playing the sax in his apartment alone tells a lot about his character yeah it really does and again that's like yeah and there's no i mean they kind of hint upon it like he well he says like i'm a musician like for Mm. his job that's so i mean and he was in and he did live in new york well he's from new york so part of me feels like he probably had a bit of a jazz uh career in a sense well see like i think you could kind of take it as like a does he tell? Because he doesn't. Because he's so paranoid about everything. That's what I mean. Does he have like? Does a... it? Yeah. Does he tell people that he's a musician to get him off his back? And he's learnt saxophone, just so that he's got something if they ever question him. Mm. Like it could yeah. just be something like that, where it's like a backup plan, so that if anyone goes, "Are you actually a musician?" Though you can go, "Oh yeah, I play the saxophone." Look. <laughs> you know? What I love about that shot, because like it starts off like at a close up on him, and it's kind of like dark. His room's dark, so and then he's got the thing playing, like he's got yeah. the, the record playing. He's got then, his record playing. Then he starts, yeah. but the close up shot it almost gives the perception where it's like it starts to make you think, "Oh, is this a cut to him playing at a jazz bar?" Yeah, and then it cuts to a wide shot of him sat just in the middle of his apartment. A really in, bare bones apartment, like you were saying. In, like. in night, he hasn't even turned the lights on yet, and he's just got records playing, and he's like, just like, just like yeah. I don't know, like someone about like I don't know, like it just it immediately communicates the feeling. It almost so shows like he wants a social life, but either mm. he either he's choosing not to have one in order to keep other people safe or himself safe. Yeah. Which is, which part of me thinks that maybe that's why he's proper secretive with this girl. Yeah. Because it's like, it's a secret girlfriend, even though he's not having an affair. It's maybe it's because if anything does fuck up with him, like maybe, because again, there's the, the thing that happened in New York is very like, it's ambiguous. Yeah. So you don't know. It's like, yeah. is he witness protection? Maybe. I don't know. Mm. Uh, which it's like, so He's probably really. He, it almost shows like that. Him playing the sax. It's like he wants to. It's almost he wants to do. He wants to have like this social life, but he can't. So he's kind of just left, just sat, just playing the saxophone in his house. Yeah. To get that out there, which uh, I love that. I mean, I thought another interesting choice with with him in his apartment in that scene, um, the bit when when he's on the phone talking about the birthday present. When he's sat on his sofa there, he doesn't have any trousers on. Yeah. He's just sat in his, un- he's just sat in his underwear and a shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which looks kind of like, kind of, I don't want to say pathetic, but kind of just like, and he's just kind of like a, a dude. No, I know what you mean. You know what I mean? Like, he's just a no, guy. No man that is shown in their underwear and still got a top on looks yeah. like, oh, that's a strong bloke. 
That's it. Exactly, yeah. You, it, doesn't, but, it doesn't happen. You can, but you can be a really strong bloke. But if you get caught with your trousers down, you're not. No, it's, you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna have some sort of pathetic look to you. It's literally a saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that was just a really interesting choice to have him like that because it really does kind of illustrate his personal life outside of work. Yeah. It's nothing. Do you know what I kind of relate this film to? Think about it in a sense. And I, mm-hmm. you know, and this is just a general thing that, like, um, don't, uh, guy, uh, uh, listeners don't uh, freak out because I mentioned the name. But I, mm. I kind of, like, almost relate this film to. Uh, it's almost like a darker feature length episode of Louis. Yeah. Like, it's. Kind of. It's a similar thing of, like, it's kind of just a dude doing his thing. He gets wrapped up in a situation. And he kind of looks pathetic at times, and he's a yeah. and he's a sad bloke. <laughs> That's kind. Of, yeah, that, but, but it's like that taken to not the lay, not not yeah. the way that that show takes it of being like it's that for the sake of comedy. Yeah, for this it's that for the sake of yeah really intense stuff. Like it's just kind of it's that kind of premise, but flipped. You could really make this script into many different types of. Thing. you could 100 percent. it could be a full-on horror it could be a comedy if you really wanted it could genuinely it could get turned into a bit of a dark surrealist comedy yeah it, oh uh, yeah easily yeah especially yeah. with the banter between the characters like that could just be yeah like yeah no definitely like i said ghostbusters yeah Boom. no yeah definitely <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah um i've noted here that the fact how like uh, i mentioned it there how him being religious is beautifully shown and not told um, yeah, but I think that's a lot of this film. It's prime example of show don't tell. Yeah, and I said that about The Godfather as well. And I'm starting to think I'm like, there's moments in Apocalypse Now which I can't wait to discuss that with you in two weeks' time. Yeah, um, I'm excited to see that. Yeah, um, I've recently been getting into a lot of uh, that time period anyway. So like, like right like, with a. Uh, Defy Bloods. I enjoyed. Yeah. I enjoyed oh that my a lot. god, it was incredible. I, I liked it. I, a lot. I loved it so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, but um, I, but a, a lot. Coppola is really good at the show. Don't tell. And I'm surprised that didn't get like. I mean, maybe maybe it just didn't come to our lecturer's mind. But may but I like, I genuinely feel like maybe looking into Coppola's scripts is a brilliant way to look at like how to sure. look. Like yeah, like and of course you think Coppola. A lot of people can say, "Oh, Godfather," which yeah, which yeah, good doy. Yeah, but also, <laughs> but, I mean, from talking about this film, it is true. Like, well, yeah, this film should really be a little bit more analyzed, especially with uh, film students. I do think. Yeah, yeah, it should be. It. It. I cannot sing this film's praises enough mm-hmm. to try and make it more known to people because I just honestly can't believe I'd never heard of it before. Yeah. I knew you would like it, but, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, but I didn't know like how much you would like it. Yeah. And the last point I've got to say here is like I think like he get I know he gets wrapped up in others' lives to live vicariously through them. Question mark. But then part of me is seeing himself. Maybe that's where he gets like it. Like he's in the surveillance business. Either is it because does he have such an isolated mindset in life because he's in the surveillance business or is he in the surveillance business because he has such an isolated life? Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I, I kind of took it as like he's, it's the development of his career in surveillance that has led him into slowly becoming more and more paranoid because he's seen the power of the technology that he has. I can agree. And I, what he can do with it. Yeah, I agree with that. But I think, but I know that down because I thought that was an interesting thing. Like, is he like, yeah. is he fearful for death because he's imagining this happening to him? Or is he, mm. or is he just being a good guy and he doesn't want them to die? And it can work both ways. Yeah. It's, it, it's really is a film that can be debated and analyzed and it's, like yeah, just to just to hammer it home, it's so layered. Mm. It's a really layered, really well thought out script that I probably will have a read of at some point. Actually, yeah, I need to look for it. I need to yeah. try and investigate. But that's all the notes I had. Let's discuss so, the ending because this because right. I love the end shot, and I will say my 
This was legitimately my reaction when I first watched the film two years ago. It was that mm. end swivel shot. I was like, okay, what's where are we going to go next? And then the cast yeah. pops up. And I'm like, oh, oh, that was the end. And then I started reflecting on the entire film from then on. I was like, wait a minute. What? Huh? Yeah. And then, <laughs> but yeah, go on. This is my, so that's kind of my thing with it. Is Which that, I'm very interested because of how highly you've sung the praises of this film. And yeah, you I, like, yeah. I love this movie, but it's just the, the thing that kind of got me about the ending mm-hmm. is that I thought when he, it's when Harrison Ford rings him and says, uh, yeah. um, and, and basically tells him we we're watching you. Which is his like, which seems to be as it's been set up throughout the movie is is one of his biggest fears is the fact that other people are watching him. And then he starts playing him playing the saxophone. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And then it's and then it's him tearing up his apartment for a good solid five minutes. And at that point, I thought, oh my god, where do, like you said, where does the story go from here? I checked how much time I had left. There's five minutes left, and I thought, does does this have a sequel? <laughs> Like, it can't... I was like, it, it can't just end here. The discussion. Yeah, I just... Like, what? Like, it can't just end. Like, there's no there's no way this is the ending of it. And it just... He, he rips up his apartment for five minutes, tries... He looks through everywhere to find where they could be bugging him from. Destroys the Virgin Fa- Mary. Destroys the Virgin Mary, which is the last place he looks, which I thought that's where the microphone was going to be because if there was any... If they knew him... If they'd done loads of research onto him, they'd know that the last thing that he'd want to destroy is the Virgin Mary. But it wasn't, anyway. And he doesn't end up... As, as far as I could tell, he doesn't end up finding the microphone. No. I mean, there's many theories to go by, and there's a bit of trivia that right, links okay. to that, which is interesting. Right. Because, but... to me, he doesn't end up finding the microphone. And he is just... The, then the, the final shot is the the shot that looks like a surveillance camera that pans across the apartment that is completely destroyed looking I love I love the shot like that visual just that general yeah oh of, god yeah of like a dude playing saxophone in a wrecked apartment I don't know that's just like a really visually pleasing shot yeah really. but I think I mean now that I'm discussing it more I kind of like it more because the my first thought of why I dislike it is because he hasn't learned anything He's gone through this entire movie and I kind of like when it when it was the point where I thought, oh, it's the girl that's going to be killed in the hotel room. I, I was like, he's going to be a hero and he's going to go in and he's going to stop it. And that's why he's got the apartment next door. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was excited for. I was like, oh, he's going to have this hero moment where he saves him. And I thought that was going to be his arc. He's going to like, wh- that- he's going to whip his raincoat and then throws him over. There. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> throw some smoke pellets on the floor or something. <laughs> But I, I got like excited for something like that to happen and then it didn't. And I thought, right, so what is his arc then? And then all the rest of the stuff happened. You realise what the murder actually was. And then there's this bit at the end. And it's it, you realise that it's not really about him learning anything. Mm-hmm. It's more of like... The story's more of a tragedy than anything else. Mm-hmm. And it kind of has an ending that's kind of like an ending to a Twilight Zone episode. Yeah. I need, like I, this I, guy, I need to watch Twilight Zone. I really do. I yeah. Really watch but just like this dude going through all this stuff and bad things happening to him constantly and he's trying to... He's l- slowly losing himself to it. And at the end, when you, just when you want him to break free of it all, it all becomes his worst nightmare and it finishes there. Yeah. And it's like really... Now that I'm thinking about it, I kind of do like it because it really cements the movie as a, like a cautionary tale and just kind of a really and I like, tragic story. Yeah, and I like how it's him sat playing the sax almost like he's trying to just move on from it. Even though he's in yeah, this like barren saying, waste, yeah. even though he's in this barren wasteland of like what he's just done, but he's like, well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like and and like you were saying earlier about the saxophone maybe symbolizing like a, a social life that he wishes he, wishes he had, mm. but he now definitely cannot have mm. because of what's just happened. Yeah, yeah, because it's like he's bugged and he's like, like it's like we know what you we know what you know. So he's like, yeah. oh, this is me screwed then. Oh, I kind of like it. Yeah. God damn it, I'm going back on my word. <laughs> I kind of like it because it's also, if he'd, I like the fact that, I, if, if you, I mean, you'll tell me about it in the trivia, like you were saying, <clears> but the, if he didn't find the microphone, 
I really like that because he's this he's set up throughout the movie as like the best of the best in the surveillance game yeah. and everyone knows him and he's famous in that in that industry and I always thought to myself like well what's that got to do with anything it's never relevant it's never really brought up properly and like yeah. what what relevance to it ha- does it have but he gets bugged at the end and can't find the microphone yeah, it kind that's... of is like it's moved past him now because it's all... he's not the best of the best anymore yeah it's a good point because it's like we've established that he's like in terms of so because it's almost like he's not good at social at being social or like at like no being like hu- at human interactions and we kind of like see that like the one time he tries to be human and the one time where he feels like he's got a closeness to this person turns out she's just backstabbed him and she nicked the yeah. rail from him so it's like he's like right he sucks at social and he goes <laughs> that one line read i love that goes bitch like it's just like, yeah. such, like, it's such, <laughs> i love that just that it's one of my favorite it might be my favorite reading of the word bitch in any film <laughs> good, bitch and then um so it's like we've already established he sucks at social life and he tried and he sucks at it and he st- yeah. and he's still not good at it. he's in his 40s we assume and um he still sucks at this but we established that he's just mint at surveillance and even that point of when he um um cleans up the audio and he we hear the thing of like um he kills us if he has the chance like he gets that it's like like and yeah. of course like us being film students we uh are not and but we, even though we're not um uh primarily in the sound game of it all and mm-hmm. but I, my thought was like i don't even know how you would do that i don't even know how you would retreat no, i'd probably just try my hardest with a 10 band equalizer or something just pretend like i know what i'm doing yeah because even we're told we're like i mean there's only so much you can do with shit audio like we yeah. like so, so then part of me is like and then if he can retrieve that to make it crisp so it's like it's like he's has already established that he's just fucking mint and he's yeah. it's almost like he's unstoppable until the end when he's not exactly which almost like it does like almost assumes like yeah all right the one thing you thought you were amazing at you're not even the best at that no exactly because it's like, um, well, it's like the thing that I've been reading recently. Because uh, this is weird. This seems like a weird running theme that we're having on this podcast. On the first episode, I was on about how I'd read Save the Cat. I've been reading The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. Okay. He, he there's a the the second chapter of that book is um, about the differences between different stories of tragedy and comedy, mm-hmm. um, which he in in like Greek myths specifically. But it kind of relates here in terms of what a tra- what he describes a tragedy as being. It's a movie. It's like a movie or a story or whatever that doesn't that doesn't let you forget about the harsh realities of life. Mm. A, and he says that a comedy is where you forget about that and you forget about how oh death is the end and blah 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 blah. blah. You forget about it because the story's made you forget. It's taking you into a different world than you whatever. Yeah. A tragedy. You follow a person and you're consistently reminded, oh, yeah, the world is a bit of shit, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And life is a bit of shit. And it's, it is a really good example. <laughs> this this script generally is a really great example of a tragedy, really. Yeah, no, of definitely. Of a Greek tragedy. <laughs> no, it definitely is. And I'm like, I'm thinking about that. And I'm just saying, I'm thinking about that. worried about that scene. I just thought about that. And once again, connected it to Louis. I remember mm. there's a scene in Louis. I think, I forgot which scene, it, which season it was. It's, when he's um trying to sort it's it cuts to him on Christmas morning and his daughter's opening presents and they're like, Oh I love yeah, I'm so happy and then it cuts to Louie like trying like what he had to do to get that present. And then she's like, Oh, yeah. a monkey a blue monkey, just what I wanted and then cuts to Louie in a toy shop. Like I'm look like in a busy ball, <laughs> just like I'm looking for a blue monkey. A bl- a blue monkey <laughs> <laughs> and, but, then there's a, but then there's a bit where like um the one of the daughters picks up this doll she's like oh just what i wanted and then it cuts to this really elongated scene of him opening this doll and then seeing the eyes of the doll fell out into the skull of the doll and then him trying to like unscrew this doll and then like trying to fix the eyes this really prolonged scene and it just reminded me of like the conversation and i'm just like of him just wrecking the apartment and like in the, yeah in the scene it eventually like has louis just like trying to like make new eyes to put in this doll and him <laughs> just crying over the toilet because he also and it's like i'm just like imagining that like and again like that you could switch like that scene of louis being absolutely distraught of trying to fix a, a doll could be looked at as a tragedy 
in a sense of like oh, easily, he, yeah. he's a single dad and he just wants to make his daughter happy but uh, yeah. but uh, it's played off as like this really like funny moment and a similar thing with almost the conversation you could switch that and make that comedic like where he's wrecking yeah, his yeah. apartment what an idiot you know what i mean or, or like yeah. or like when he wrecks the Virgin Mary, that could be played as like, wah, 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 like that, like, oh, wah, 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 <laughs> oh, now I broke the Virgin Mary. But it's almost like, Jesus, he's gone through all of this. He even has yeah. to go through that. And it's like... He's pushed to an edge. Yeah, and he, and, and you saying yeah. it there, because even like, because I almost thought about it in the sense of like, you can look at like, oh, he doesn't want to get bugged. You can look at it in the mm. sense of like, he's trying to find the bug because he's like, I have to know where it is because otherwise, what else am I? Like if yeah. I can't find a bug, what else is there to me? Yeah. Because like, he's like, it's so simple. They've clearly bugged me. It must be something in the phone. It's not. It mu- what else could it be? And so it's, yeah. And then picking up the saxophone, it's like, well, I guess this is all I have left. Yeah. But yeah. But no, definitely. Oh, yeah. um, is there any final thing you want to say about the film? Um, before we move on to the other additional things on the podcast. No, I feel like I've gushed about it enough. The Conversation is an excellent film. Highly yes, under highly underappreciated. I forgot how good it was until I rewatched it again last night. And yeah. I've grown a further appreciation from it from discussing it with you. Um and I I'm do I'm shocked at how much I loved it. You what? I'm shocked at how much I loved it. I, I'm surprised at how much you liked it. Yeah. Because I knew <laughs> you would great. like you I knew you would like it, but part of me was like is he going to find this boring? But then part of me is like, no, probably not, because there's enough stuff happening. Yeah. But yeah. It doesn't drag at any point. No, not It's a really well-paced film. Like, I was watching, um, me and Julia have been watching Lord of the Rings, mm. and there's parts in those movies that I'm like, what is, why is this happening? I'm not a fan of them, but... But, I mean, I I love those movies with all yeah. my heart, but this, the, this film specifically has no points of, like... This could be taken out. It's a solid under two hour thriller. Is yeah. the best way I can describe it. Yeah. And yeah. Almost Fincher esque as well. This is a very, this is a film that I think Fincher would have really loved to yeah. do. I mean, the game, yeah, yeah. the game is almost, have you seen the game? I haven't seen the game, no. It's good. It's a good one. Yeah. I wouldn't mind doing That's another one we can add Fincher to doing a thing. To there do. we go. Yeah. I haven't seen a lot of Fincher, really. Haven't you? I've seen some. I've seen Seven, Good Social stuff. Network, Good stuff. Gone Girl. Great stuff. That's probably about it. Social Network? Yeah, I've seen Social Network. Uh, we said, you said that, didn't you? Um, yeah. Girl with, <laughs> girl with the Dragon Tattoo? Nope. Mum and Dad really like that. The, ri- the, the original is fantastic. The original. Yeah. Uh, Curious Case of Benjamin Button? No. Um, Looks real weird. <laughs> I like it a lot. Uh, Zodiac? Yeah. Never seen Zodiac. You would like that, I think. My uh, sister was writing a raven about Zodiac the other day. Ah, it's class. Uh, I really need to say that. Panic Room? No. Panic Room's fun. See, these... Yeah. This is why this podcast is helpful, you know. This is why I want to... I call myself a film fan. And I need to... <laughs> I need to stop being an idiot about it. But... No, well, you are. You're, you're 19 and you, you, you're only... You, you've seen a lot. Yeah. You've seen a lot. <laughs> You've seen it, no, you've seen, I mean, I was in the same place when I was like, I'm a film fan, but I still need to see loads. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Like, that's, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what I wanted, because I want to revisit some stuff, and I want to see what it's like from some, from a new perspective as well. So that's what I'm using that for as well. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. So I want to go on to some fun film facts, trivia stuff again. Trivia, trivia, trivia. I get all of this from IMDb. So if you really want to really delve further into it, you can go onto the conversations IMDb page and go into it through there. So one thing I've got here, first bit of trivia, as Harry refines and refines the recording, he interprets what he hears in different ways. In fact, the dialogue was recorded multiple times with different readings to get this effect. Jesus Christ. Which sounds like a nightmare. That sounds awful. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because you know you have to go, right, we need a- another take. And the actors are probably like, God's sake. Doing this Can again. you do it the exact same but kind of different because it needs to sound like it's the same recording? Yeah, yeah. Awful. <laughs> God, no, no, no. God damn it. Um, <laughs> the blue Mercedes limousine that Cindy Williams, who is the woman 
in the yeah. conversation. Um, is sitting in near the end of the film was won by Francis Ford Coppola on a bet with Paramount Pictures. Coppola had complained about the station wagon he shared with five other passengers during the filming of The Godfather. Studio executives told him that if The Godfather had grossed a certain amount, they would spring for a new car. After The Godfather became the highest grossing film of all time, Coppola and George Lucas went to a dealer and picked out the Mercedes, telling the, sa- <laughs> telling the salesman to bill Paramount Pictures. Amazing. I mean, I bet the salesman was like, "What are you talking about? No, you need to pay for this." <laughs> what? What do you mean? Yeah, they just they just come in like slap the thing on the thing and like tell Paramount Pictures to pay for this, and then they're like, "Who? What? Who do I specifically go to? A whole company? What? We can't just do. look like idiots. We can't do. We can't swag up and be like, we we get a car, like you get a car, and then we go tell the Northern School of Art it's on them." <laughs> Yeah, it's like, who specifically, though? Like, the whole, like, yeah, that's what I meant, as in, like, before you said, um, with studio executives. Like, when you said he made a bet with Paramount, I'm like, what, all of them? <laughs> the, the, entire uh, everyone? Studio, the entire production company's like, yeah, it's not gonna do good, though, is it? <laughs> yeah. Shut up, Francis. Sounds weird when you just call him Francis. Francis, yeah. I like to call him <laughs> I, uh, Frankie. <laughs> Frankie Ford Coppola. Frankie Coppola. That sounds like a Greasehead mobster. Yeah, it does actually. Yeah. Tell her to Frankie Coppola. Um, <laughs> uh, Gene Hackman learned to play the saxophone, especially for this film. Oh, brilliant. Dedication. That is great. Yeah, Dedication, that's great man. You know when you hear something that just makes you smile. Yeah, yeah. That reminds that. that reminds me of um, when I was when we were doing. Um, the uni project the uni film the muse for anyone who's unfamiliar it's a film that we did that i directed um based on my script that robbie was editor on for uni this year uh the main the main character is a painter and i didn't even really have to tell joe the actor about it and like the very first read through he went oscar i've been looking i've been watching i've been researching pain and watching a load of painting videos for this and i was like thanks joe what have you been watching he went a lot of bob ross I went, that's fair. What, what a guy. I love him so much. But yeah, just, I just it's like... I love little things like that. Yeah. It's like Ryan Gosling playing the piano for La La Land. And yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. Really great stuff. Uh, we already said this is Gene Hackman's favourite film that he has acted in. Um, I think he's forgetting about Superman 2. <laughs> <laughs> um... G- that one where he's not in half of it, fun fact, <laughs> because they couldn't. It, the it was after Richard Donner got sacked yeah. and brought the new director in, uh, they couldn't get Gene Hackman back. So for a lot of the shots where it's meant to be Lex Luthor's in the background, that's not Gene Hackman. Oh really? I haven't seen the films, yeah. but that's interesting. Yeah. Um, Gene Hackman was a fit, good-looking, good relatively young man when Francis Ford Coppola cast him as Harry Cole. In order to personify Harry's wary, aging, and unhappy existence, Jesus Christ, I'm deep. Yeah, that was a bit, you know. Yeah, Christ. Um, That's written by a random person. I know, yeah. <laughs> His weary, aged, and unhappy existence. God damn it. Um, I mean, I agree, I mean, agree, but when you put it into words, it's a bit, you know. It was a bit <laughs> Calm much. down, mate. Um, Hackman, Leave the guy alone. Um, Hackman, <laughs> this is the word of this trivia. Anyway, I'm going to get through it. In order, in order to personify Harry's wary, aged, and unhappy existence, Hackman grew a pathetic-looking moustache, wore an, <laughs> wore an ill-fitting gla- wore ill-fitting glasses, and unhappy wardrobe picked out. No, and had a wardrobe picked out that was at least ten years out of date. Copeland specifically told Hackman he wanted Harry to look nu- nudnik, a Yiddish word referred to a person. Who is boring and a pest? Which I think is pretty. Cool. <laughs> one thing I like there. One thing that Incy came to my mind. Hackman grew a pathetic-looking mustache. I Incy thought that review that we read last week about the guy who said about the Godfather. Oh my God! Yeah, the mustaches, mustaches are stupid. The mustaches aren't good enough. And I just... <laughs> but like, what? I mean, what defines a pathetic mustache? Hang on, let me look. I mean, at... mine probably. Mine'll be up there with pathetic mustaches. Hang on, let me look at Gene Hat Gene uh, the conversation nineteen 19- Oh Alvin and call it a pathetic mustache. Conversation nineteen seventy four. That's some solid man bush, I would say. <laughs> uh 
Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. You know what? It's not a bad mustache. Yeah. I'm sure, like, Robbie, leave, I'm showing you. Sc- look at that. That's that's a solid what? mustache. That's a solid mustache. Leave him alone. Anyway. It, it'd be more if it was like a th- pathetic, like, haircut because he's got kind of like thin on top and stuff. Yeah. 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 But anyway, that's. Look, yeah. They had, they, they had to dress uh, Hackman immensely to make that, it, which, yeah. I mean, it works well. Yeah, it does, you know. He, he looks apart. Yeah. Right. On the DVD commentary, which I, which I've, the, the Blu-ray I've got has the commentary, which I'm very, which I really am interested in watching. Uh, on the DVD yeah. commentary, Francis Ford Coppola says he was shocked to learn that the film utilized the very same surveillance and wiretapping equipment that members of the Nixon administration used to spy on political opponents prior to the war- Watergate scandal. Coppola has said... Mm. This is the reason the film gained part of the recognition it has received, but that this is entirely coincidental. Not only was the script completed in the mid-60s, before the Nixon administration came to power, but the spy and equipment used in the film was discovered through research and the use of the technical advisors, and not, um, as many believed, by relatively newspaper stories about the Watergate break-in. Coppola also noted that the film had been completed several months before the most relevatory uh, Watergate stories broke in the press. Since the film was released in theatres just a few months before Richard Nixon resigned as president, Coppola felt that audiences interpreted the film to be a reaction to both the Watergate scandal and its fallout. Which talk, ah. ab- which talk about coming out coincidentally in a timely manner. Yeah, we talked about. Def- I mean, I mean, it's a similar thing in terms of now. We talked about the five bloods. I can't think of a better time for the five bloods. Oh to come god, out. yeah, exactly. Which, I mean, yeah, definitely. That's like, that's really interesting though because it, um, Bernie says something about something like that about influencing politics with the surveillance. Yeah, I've got a bit of trivia. He says, about, that, he, yeah. he says about it in the party scene. Yeah. So I, I, I did actually think, like, is that something to do with the politics of the time? Yeah. But, Intra- you know, I, I, I didn't even think about Watergate, but yeah. It's fascinating, yeah. Yeah, that is really interesting. David Shire's original music was composed prior to production and played for the actors prior to their scenes to get them into the proper moods. I mean, and is also really good. It's a good score. It's how, it's, it's how that trivia should have finished. It's a good score. Yeah. It really is. It's really great. But yeah. So, yeah, like, I mean, we always hear about the score. Well, traditionally, the score is done... Uh, in post production, because that's when you can see the film and all that, like yeah. That. But no, yeah, the the score was done before the film uh, was filmed, which I think is always cool. I know Joker. Yeah. J- that happened with Joker. Um, they would do it with. Um, fun fact: here's something that I learned in my in my uni research. Sergio Leone does that um, mm. because he he plays the music whilst they're filming uh, to try and. To try and get the actors in the mood. Any of Morricone's stuff? Yeah. Uh, we, we, he, play, he, he plays it on set whilst they're recording. Uh, we, need, we need to do some Sergio Leone. I really want it. We uh, do, yeah. Uh, I love I, I, Good, the bad, and the ugly is Chef's Kiss. And Yeah. I think it was... I think the one that I looked at specifically is in um, Once Upon a Time in the West. Oh, that's a... Oh, the harmonica. When, when the... It, yeah, no, it's the bit when the... I um, can't remember what the woman's called when she gets off the train right at the beginning yes. and is in this new world and everything, the score that's playing there was played on set because it's meant to be like a really emotional song. It's oh, meant right. to get her more upset. Have you seen, yeah. have you, you've so, seen that, haven't you? Nope. No, you haven't seen Once Upon a Time in West? I haven't seen Good, the Bad and the Ugly. I know that. I know you haven't seen that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I haven't seen... I haven't really seen any of those. I've seen for a few dollars more, I think. Or Fistful of Dollars, whichever one's the first one. Uh, I think for a few dollars more is the first. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I want to. Uh, there you go. That's another one. D- talk there about talk about Leone. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, here's a fun fact, Robbie. Yes. In contradiction to trivia read from last week, the or- okay. the original cut of the conversation was four and a half hours long. Most sig- oh. most significant was a subplot of Harry dealing with his neighbours who complain about the building's plumbing problems because within this cut as well he's the owner he's the tenant of the 
complex. I got uh, yeah, because yeah. that's kind of brought up and then never yeah. talked about again. Yeah, yeah. Um, other scenes feature Harry consulting his lawyer, who's played by Abe Vigoda, who was in The Godfather. I forgot the guy's name. Um, he's the guy that um, um, Michael susses out in his family that is going to uh, give an information to Barzini. Oh, the one at the, fu- um, the one at the funeral where he's uh, yeah. yeah yeah him he was in the film as a lawyer to Gene Hackman. All right. Um, and Harry and another subplot was included of Harry convincing his teenage niece, played me, played by Mackenzie Phillips, not to run away from home. So there was like three different subplots that was cut from the film. I'm glad they were though. And I agree, it makes it such a streamline. Yeah, it just makes it such an easier, just kind of like moves at a clip. It just yeah, there's no need for it. If the film, if it was a mini series those would have been then, interesting yeah. things. I think that would have been cool because that would have been kind of like bringing it back to this. It would have been a darker version of Louis if that yeah. was the case. And that would have been cool. But again, a four and a half hour cut of this film, I wouldn't have, no. Nah. I don't need to see nah, that. No, nah, I'm, nah, I'm, nah. I'm fine with it being just under two hours. Yeah. Um, Francis Ford Coppola tried to get, uh, I, I think I hinted about this, but may as well read mm. the whole thing. Francis Ford Coppola tried to get funding for the film and failed to interest any studio or other investors it was only after the godfather was a hit that paramount pictures offered him the money for the conversation uh coppola said that if it wasn't for the godfather this movie would have never been made which wow well. i mean they, i think either filmmakers today do that like nolan does that i think i mean yeah he was only really able to do inception because dark knight yeah exactly so uh, and which kind of cemented him as like what he is and i think oh there's other film. i mean taika watiti's doing it really he's doing like he did like thor ragnarok and then he did jojo rabbit yeah he would never have been able to do and, and it's like i mean he did he got thor ragnarok because he got put on the map by doing hunt for the world of people i thought it was what we do in the shadows or was it a bit of both i think it was a bit of both like what we do in the shadows was known but that was way before that was like a thingy. that was because that, that's how i knew about him because i yeah remember hearing about that that was like a cult hit and then, yeah it yeah. was yeah but yeah um francis ford coppola cited his conversation with fellow director Irvin kirshner about surveillance as the basis and the theme of the film so just a ah. conversation between coppola and Irvin kirshner director of uh empire strikes back for anyone who is unfamiliar with that name uh, absolute legend my i add he, he also directed robocop 2 which i haven't seen I mean, Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it back, lads. <laughs> I've heard apparently Empire Strikes Back is like his one hit, from what I understand. Right, I don't okay. know. I don't know. I can't say anything else, but yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, a conversation between Coppola and Kirshner is what influenced this film, which is cool. Very nice, yeah. Um, Francis Ford Coppola has cited Blow Up from 1966 as a key influence of his conceptualization of the film's themes, such as surveillance versus participation and perception versus reality. Blow Up is an excellent film, Robbie. Never uh, seen it, it, never heard of it. It's a really weirdly abstract British film that I kind of right. like, it has an, a Clockwork Orange feel to it. And I, th- okay. and I think it was the very first British film to show female full frontal nudity. I think it was like one of those types of things where it was right. Okay, it was like one of these X-rated films that came that was like came out. Oh, uh, like, one of those ones where it's like a myth and everyone's like, "Oh my god, have you seen?" Yeah, it? you like you know, like like a Clockwork Orange is kind of like that. Another Br- yeah. another film called Peep and Tom was like that. Blow Evil Dead was like that when it came out. Yeah, <laughs> first time. Blow Up is kind of like that and. I would like to discuss that. So I would like to revisit Blow Up. It's a film that I remember. That's a film that I remember having a good feeling about, but I couldn't tell you anything about it. Like, it's a film that yeah. I haven't quite got my head wrapped round around. But the main character is kind of like a photographer. And it's... Okay. And there's... I, I don't know. It has really cool imagery. Again, I associate with A Clock of Orange, but not being as, like, grim. <laughs> it's not as, as mental yeah, as that. It's not, it's not as yeah. grim as that. But yeah, blow up it was a key influence of the film, which I can see. I can see that. Yeah. Um, 
due to creative differences on this shoot, cinematographer Hax- Haxel Wexler was replaced by director of photography Bill Butler. According to Coppola, Wexler visualized the movie in the more romantic style of the Thomas Crown Affair, uh, while Coppola saw it more in the cinema verite, I can't pronounce it, style of <laughs> st- style of medium cool. Uh, so yeah, right. so cinematographer imagined it a bit more glossy. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, I, I think that is a very weird way of saying creative differences, which is what studios usually say nowadays yeah. when someone leaves a project. Oh, well, due to creative differences, we have decided Due to creative powers. differences. As, as opposed to, it's like, no, the director wanted to make it look glossy, whereas I wanted to make it look like, yeah. kind of like, almost like French New Wave, which yeah. the film kind of is, which that's what New Hollywood was, really. It was like Hollywood implemented foreign international filmmaking techniques that had been done decades before that but finally getting implemented which yeah you can see it in that i guess yeah definitely um the film was produced via uh, the director's company a production company formed by francis ford coppola and fellow directors william friedkin and peter bogdanovich it was in association with Paramount Pictures, allowing the directors to make any film they wanted under $3 million. This film was the second produced, but despite its success, it led to tension between Coppola and Friedkin. Friedkin didn't like the film and thought it was a rip-off of Blow Up. The film, uh, this film and then the subsequent following release, Daisy Miller, directed by uh, Bogdanovich and failed at the box office, Led to the, d- the demise of the company. Ah, hmm. that's really interesting. I want to know that. Yeah, I like that. Uh, um, thought of a production company made under the guidelines of uh, Paramount, being like, you can do any film you want under this amount of money. Which, yeah, which, make what you want as long as it's not three million. Yeah, I think uh, Fox Searchlight did that for a while. They were like, yeah. do anything you want, but you know, to an extent. Yeah. To, to an ex- it's a nice it's a nice idea for a production yeah, company. That, really. that, that's kind of where I want to go. I kind of want to like do anything I want, but like and I'm fine with a limited budget. I'm fine with that. Yeah, yeah. Um during the party in the warehouse, Bernie Morin brags that 12 years before he had recorded the calls of an unnamed presidential candidate and may have determined who won the election. This presumably would have been in being the 1960 election when John F. Kennedy narrowly won the election over Richard Nixon, who was at the time the movie's product, who at the time of the movie's production, in the middle of his own tape and scandal known as Watergate. So there is some right. There we go. So yeah. I was going to say because it did stand out to me as something where I was like, hang on. I love things like that where films kind of reference like real life things, but they kind of just like touch upon it slightly. Yeah, just like really, really briefly. Yeah, like have you seen Bad Times at the RAL? Yeah. Like that the little slight reference to the tape murders. I love that. Yeah, yeah like I like that a lot. That's a good movie, you know, underrated. Oh, I think. Bad Times at the Royal is fantastic. Yeah, really. I really like that film. My yeah. thought is like uh, right before I read the last bit of trivia, my I've always said if people who people who don't like Once Upon a Time in the Hollywood probably wanted Bad Times at the El Royale, but yeah. a lot of them probably didn't see Bad Times at the El Royale anyway, so they wouldn't know yeah. that that's the film they wanted. Which, But it wasn't, like, critically acclaimed, weirdly. It no, was only, like, it, 70% on Rotten Tomatoes or something. It, was ne- it wasn't, like, hyped uh, massive. I loved it. I love it. Like, uh, I thought it was great. That's like, a, that's, like, right up my alley in terms of, like, pure stylized stuff yeah. oh, i love it so much really good stuff and that i think that film that was the film that cemented that i actually really liked dakota johnson yeah because i like her in um suspiria but that was they came out around about the same time and that was like mm. i saw suspiria and i saw bad times at the royale el royale i was like you know what dakota johnson min actress class yeah. honestly class <laughs> yeah. um and the final thing which is a fun little bit of trivia Extra scenes needed to complete this movie, including the one where Hackman discovers that the tape is gone, were filmed on the set of Chinatown, which came out the same year. Uh, well, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> what? Mental. It's like, I love like there's certain things, hearing certain things like that with films, because um, there's a bit in um, 
Because No Country for Old Men and There Will Be Blood were filming at the same time. And I think they were right. filming at, a sim- at the same location-ish. And have you seen There Will Be Blood? I haven't, no. Uh, I've seen No Country for Old Men, but I haven't seen There uh, Will Be Blood. Right. I need, that's another thing I need. I don't, we need to do a Paul Thomas Anderson <laughs> thing. Because Paul Thomas Anderson is one of my fave filmmakers. And there's films in there which I think to myself, Robbie will probably hate this, but I would want to. But it's one of these ones where I'm like, I want to know why he would. <laughs> like, but it'd be a funny podcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not even going to tell you what film I think it's going to be. I want to see if it is the film. But um, okay. it's a film that I genuinely love. And I think to myself, more of you might hate this film. But, um, <laughs> but, but there's a bit where there's a big oil tanker explosion in There Will Be Blood. Right. And there's like big. Fo- uh, mist and like just smoke and stuff and apparently that whole thing fucked up the filming for No Country for All Men for a bit because they're like well we can't film because there's a big fucking black cloud in the background because <laughs> <laughs> they did that so they needed so little things like that and I love the fact like that scene there where Hack, you know, the, the bitch that was it yeah. that was on the set of Chinatown oh that's great China- it's like the it's like it shows you just like the little funny little gang warfares between crews yeah oh yeah yeah that, we, that even we have no, well because it, it, well, it happens because well, like... well, it happens with us because there's moments where um there's bits where like certain film uh film crews like yeah can we just like we, we're gonna be filming in the hallway so can you like not like be screaming i wish you were fucking dead I'm like yeah okay and then uh <laughs> but, but that happens with us so of course it, it would only make sense it would just happen anyway yeah yeah Especially if you film, oh, on, like especially that. if you film on like production lots and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so that's some fun little trivia about uh, the conversation, which I think adds a little bit more. And now the next mm-hmm. bit, since it was such a success last week, let's talk. Let's read some negative letterbox reviews, Robbie. Oh, I'm so I'm so ready for some dumb shit. Right. So letterbox, I love letterbox so much. It it promotes. I think it is a wonderful place for film fans to go. And look up lists and look up reviews and, you know, have a good old time logging in the films that you've been watching. But also I enjoy looking at the half star reviews of films because <laughs> there, there's something else. As we discuss, as we discovered last week where, you know, Robert De Niro was in The Godfather. Robert De Niro, yeah. And, you know. And that the mustaches were now. Yeah, you know. So, first one, <clears throat> half a star excruciatingly slow and hollow movie with little substance with little suspense or sense of purpose a huge disappointment given that the cast uh, given the cast and the previous reviews i can't think of anything right with that no a ho- neither can i an excruciatingly excruciatingly slow and hollow movie uh, i what no i think do you know what i think this is I think this is a person who doesn't like old films. That might be it, yeah. Who's like, old movies are just boring and they have no sense of urgency and I like explosions and stuff. With 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 little suspense or sense of purpose. What? I- yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, literally listen to this entire podcast of like the purpose. Yeah, we've been, gu- we've been gushing about how, ex- how suspenseful it was uh, the entire time. Anyway, another half star review here. Um, Oh, hang on, I can see something here. Damn it. Um, I was on the edge of my seat the whole time, waiting for the credits to roll. This movie took 10 years of my life. Why did it take t- oh, off my life? It took 10 years off my life. Every time Gene played that saxophone, a new wrinkle sprouted on my forehead. No, no stakes, no tension, no character development. Boo. Again, how wrong is that? No character development. What? How can you get upset about the saxophone? <laughs> like, I feel like even if you don't like this film, you can't be angry about the saxophone. It's just nice. There's always... I love anything with a sax. Like, it just, like, really... Yeah! Uh, it just instantly makes something smooth. Yeah. I've got... A, I'm writing a script. I've got... A, well, I'm not writing a script. I've got another script in the same type of vein as um, the one that we're going to be writing. Yeah. It, a similar type of vein, which I've got the script in mind and i which you know might be one that we could write again as well um yeah that i've I, as i'm thinking about the film i'm imagining a sax soundtrack oh yeah it. so I, you know you can't go wrong with a good old sax you can't go wrong with a sax no <laughs> legitimately any film or any tv show with a saxophone it's made it more it's made it cooler 
Yeah. Games. Simpsons. Any, any video games. Who is Lisa without a saxophone? Exactly. Exactly. She's nothing. She's nothing. <laughs> you're, Get her out of here. Nothing, Lisa. Um, <laughs> uh, that's not really a review. That's just a half a star. We're saying that they watched it. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> okay, bro. Okay. Good to hear, mate. Okay, this is a one star review. What a stu- okay. What a stupid conversation. <laughs> I can't even be mad at that. <laughs> I, can't even, I can't even be mad at that. <laughs> what? Do they mean the conversation that was recorded at the beginning? Like, it's a stupid conversation. I don't know. Because <laughs> what, what does that... Like, it's, it's entirely dependent on perspective. If you're, like, you know, if you're planning to murder someone and you're also having an affair, that conversation, like, is pretty... Pretty up there, isn't it? I mean, there's even a discussion in the film how, like, Stan's like, well, what are they even talking about? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, just, I don't know. I, just, I don't know. It just, I, that, that, that tickled me. That was a funny one. Jesus Christ. I usually don't want to name the the people who say this, but I'm going to say thank you, um, M7MDM2SOD, for giving me a good chuckle. Well um, done, mate. I mean, you could have picked a better name than that, aren't we, mate? Um, <laughs> anyway, um, you can't tell me that's your birth name because it's not. Um, <laughs> another one. Okay, one star. Truthfully, one of the most boring films I've ever watched in my entire life. This ain't it, sis. Oh, God. Again, I just have to say, it's not. It's not, though. <laughs> like, it's just not, though. I... That's not, it's just not subjective. It's not. I, I, it's not It's not a boring film. I, genu- I genuinely can't. You might not be interested, but I can't say, I can't think why you would think it's boring. It's Yeah, it's like... And another one. It be, it's only going to be boring if you're like not actually watching it, and you're like on your phone or something. Yeah, and another review. This movie be boring. I j- again, it's the, that seems to be the negativity with this. Is that I just can't see. Yeah, it, it's though. just it's just people that don't click with it. I think. Right. This is. And I think they take not being invested to mean that it's boring. I, I think as well because Harry Cole isn't a conventional character, and we've said as well that that he's he's a massive shade of grey. Almost. Yeah, so 100%. there's nothing really to latch on to him with, like conventionally, I think. So I think yeah. that like can take you away from it. But I think I'd agree with that. Yeah. But I think it's like he it, it, it works. He works fine. I, I think it works w- yeah. really well. Obviously, right. This one has a bit more length to it. This seems like there's some thought put into this. Um, Ready. Every movie that's come out in the last 20 years sucks because of the bright lights and necessary pandering to an insatiable general audience of maniac teenagers that give each other blowjobs while The Rock says shit like me and what army, this army, and his biceps are revealed. Okay. I fell asleep what? I fell asleep watching this movie and woke up pissed because I still knew what was going on. Um, I've realized movies were never good, so nothing's been ruined. From now on, I'm only going to watch p- pear-shaped dull- dullards on YouTube bitch about how the new a how the new Axe 4-in-1 commercial is pandering to SJWs. Entertainment has surpassed motion pictures. Oh, so this is just a review saying films suck. Is this, ma- is this guy all right? <laughs> I mean... Does he need, does he need help? Because like that that sounded really that sounds like a manifesto. Upsetting. That sounds like a manifesto, doesn't it? It was yeah. It sounded like a kind of a like that's pent up anger for a long time. This is gonna be that's been best out. This is gonna be really awkward if I find out this guy like committed a mass genocide. Yeah, this is like, yeah. like am I reading like am I reading a. Uh, a murderer's last words before he offed himself. But, like, am I, like what's happening? Here's this thing on a lighter note. Um, ta- I just got a thing, a notification saying Talia Martin has mentioned you in the in the story. Yeah, I've just seen and that. And she's uh, she's plugged the podcast. Ah, oh, Talia, you legend. She's put she's put a screenshot on and put go give it a lis- little listen. So if y'all listen to the second episode, Talia. We just read that out loud. This is the first time I saw that story. Thank you very much. You're, you're awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. And moving swiftly on from that review, um, yes. there's another one that says boring, which, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> another one, um, I hate it so much. 
I get what they were going for with the sound, but it did not work at all. Only good things about this film are the cinematography and the soundtrack. Eh, I mean, you know, that that's purely perception. That's like, okay, that's a fair review for that person. That's a that's a reasonable opinion. Yeah. Um, I'll give him that. There's a one star review, loud irritating noises. <laughs> Is that? Did they watch the first five minutes? <laughs> they were like, I'm done. Is that, is that? Is that? Is that me within the first thirty seconds of the film? If I realised that it was a stylistic choice. <laughs> yeah. God damn it! They were done instantly. Like, what is this? <laughs> what? What is this? Why does it sound weird? Uh, next review. Uh, I guess it was my fault for expecting the build to go somewhere. Commenting about the end, it, I assume. But it did. Yeah. But it did. Yeah. Just to, all you need to do is, right, if you don't like the ending, sit down for two hours with one of your friends and talk about the movie until you like it. That's what I've done and it worked. Yeah, there you go. I like, I like the ending now. <laughs> <laughs> Last review. I did a full 180. Go on. Last review on this. I cannot believe I actually managed to stay awake through this whole movie. You know what? These ones weren't as fun as The Godfather. No, they weren't because there wasn't any, like, really stupid ones, like, about mustaches and stuff. No. They... It was more just, oh, it's real boring. Yeah, that was it. And that really kind of disturbing one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> didn't think we would go right into that at this early in no, the podcast. No, I didn't think we'd go right into that one, but Jesus Christ. <laughs> that man that man is... That, that's, yeah, he's not doing all right. Right. I hope you're okay, whoever you are. <laughs> right, so that was negative letterbox reviews. Always a fun time. Again, barring that yeah. one thing. Um, let's commence towards the wrap-up for this episode. Okay. I want to remind people once again that um, links will still be in the description of uh, contributions you can make towards the Black Lives Matter movement because again, as I said last week, it, it's never not going to be relevant. So, oh, yeah. so again, keep educated with it. Links will still be in the description below uh, for all of that stuff there. Also, with this being Pride Month, I want to say Happy Pride Month, everyone. Be nice yeah. towards that whole thing. Big up, happy pride. Big up, my sister. There you go. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think if there was anyone that I knew that's in the LGBT community. I don't know any. <laughs> I know literally no one. Uh, from the, <laughs> so there you go. Um, but yeah, and also, I want to also throw out there, support cinemas. Keep supporting your independent cinema. We're coming up to a point where... Um, cinemas are soon to be open again. The Woo! Uh, View, the View cinema chain will be opening on the 4th of July, which is wonderful for me uh, mm-hmm. since that's my local cinema. And Cineworld Showcase and Odeon will be opening on 10th of July. So what I would say is go uh, support cinema. There will be precautions in place. Of course there will be. So I would say don't be afraid to go. I mean, if you are afraid, yeah. understandable, completely understandable. But also, don't be afraid to go and support your cinema as well. Um, I believe some cinemas are going to be re-showing old films for now to, in order to... Um, yeah, they're re-releasing Inception before uh, Tenet comes out. Uh, I love that. Yeah, it's exciting. That film, And that's where some Dune footage is going to be shown. Yeah, it is, yeah. Class. Looking forward to that. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Fun fact... I missed Inception in the cinema. I was good. I didn't see it in cinema. That was the film. That was a film that I was so excited. I would have been fifteen when that was in the cinema. I mean, I'd have been eight. You'd be nine. So I... You'd be nine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't have seen it in cinema, so, regardless. So I remember being excited for it, and I didn't get to see it. I can't remember why. I just didn't. So I remember day one, got the DVD, watched it, knew I loved it yeah. right away. Good. So yeah, support cinemas. View cinemas will be open the fourth of July. Mm-hmm. Odeon Cine World Showcase on the tenth of July. And I'm not sure about any independent cinemas, but again, keep looking up to that. I know Tyneside has still got donations open. I keep mentioning Tyneside just because that's my um, independent. Local independent. That's my independent cinema of choice. But whatever independent cinema you're loyal to, go and support them still. And. Um, Next week, Robbie, mm-hmm. we'll be watching The Godfather Part 2. Yes, I'm very excited. I'm very intrigued. I'm so intrigued. I thought, because my, my plan for this was like, right, we do Godfather. 
we'll give us space. We'll give a week. My plan was almost to make the conversation almost the quote unquote intermission in between. Almost like the uh, nice, almost like the calm. Like, okay, we'll just have a bit of a chill time. We'll watch another film uh, by Coppola and then we'll get to The Godfather 2. And then to which we ended up really gushing about the conversation. So it's going to be very interesting how we both feel about The Godfather Part 2. I've seen it once before. Uh, I've never seen it. So by all accounts I've heard, it's the best one uh, of The Godfather trilogy. As I said last week, I preferred the first film but i also love the second one but i also can't remember a lot about the second one so it's going to be a lot of it's going to be fresh opinions almost yeah and again there's one scene i watched it earlier this week the scene that i mentioned to you last week about has maybe pacino's best acting in it yeah and i re i re-watched that scene specifically because i when i was editing the podcast uh the godfather podcast i was like all right let me like just watch that scene again fuck man it's so good and I can't. Wait. I'm, I'm really can't excited. Fucking, and again, I can't remember anything else other than that bit of the film. Okay. And it's an over three hour long film, so there's a lot to it. <laughs> and I'm gonna yeah. be. Intre- I'm gonna be interested. I wonder if. I wonder if I'll think this one's real boring. That's what I'm interested in because I'm thinking myself. You, if you found the first film boring, you might. I don't know though. I, I don't know. I didn't think it was boring. I just it was the like. There's one part where it just slows down for a good chunk of the movie. I, and I'm, yeah, seeing if it's gonna have that again. I, I misspoke. Yeah, you you didn't find the film boring. You would have cut a bit out. That's what. Yes, yeah. exactly. But yeah. um, safe to say, at the minute, we're not gonna do this for every fucking film because that'll be infuriating once it gets to a certain point. But safe to say, out of the films we've discussed on the Intermission podcast, I you I would say safe to say you say Conversation then Godfather, in terms of best. Oh uh, yeah, 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 which is fair. I prefer Godfather, but I love talking about the conversation just now. Like that was Oh like yeah, that. it was really good, nice little conversation. Oh damn it. God damn it. <laughs> God. <laughs> I'm so good. Robbie the Woodpecker. Rob- Robbie the Woodpecker. Uh, Robbie the professional stand up woodpecker, can I say? Nice we, that we, we, we need to get you we need we need to find a way how we can do that, Robbie. We need to find a we need to funnel a way to get you doing stand up uh Soon, oh, it? oh yes! As soon as I'm back in Hartlepool, <laughs> I need a new show. <laughs> you know all the all the stand up clubs in Hartlepool. <laughs> all the stand up clubs that exist. <laughs> we're doing it in spoons. <laughs> just, I'll just stand in a corner and shout at people. <laughs> You'll do it in communal two in Titan. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. <laughs> Any... As long as people are watching. So that's fine. By so me. next week, ladies and gentlemen, we will be discussing The Godfather part two let me see if i can find a way let me see if i can find any information because you know what i would like people to watch along with us and you know get involved with stuff as well let's see is it on anything right apparently um like the conversation the godfather part two is on now tv so if you're in the uk that's a way to watch it as well as you can just get the blu-ray or dvd so there you go Cool. And Sky Go. If you'd like to watch. Apparently it's on Sky Go as Feel- well. So yeah, I don't know. Is there any way to contact us? Like we could have a letter section. I mean you can like a little I mean you can um DM the Instagram. That's where I would be more active on there in terms of yeah. uh, do you want me to give you the deets for the Instagram account as well, Robbie? So you're just Yeah, so sure. you have it as well. Yeah, there yeah. you go, I can do that there. So if cool. if anyone wants to Go over to Instagram at the Intermission Podcast. You could go on Twitter as well, but the Twitter is, you know, it's just kind of the Instagram, but not as interactive in all honesty. Uh, Again, links will be in the description for that. Uh, Links, uh, you can follow me on Letterboxd. Um, Again, links will be in the description there. You can follow Robbie on Instagram. Which yeah. is if I if I take a while to accept your follow request, I'm sorry. I'm not very good at looking at them. I've got like 150 or something that I haven't looked at. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> but also as well, check out everything else that we're a part of. Links will be in the description below. You can see all the timer media stuff that uh, I am linked with. You can see uh, Robbie's other podcast that he does as well. Um, everything there. Is there anything else you want to say before? We sign off, Robbie. 
Not really. Go watch the conversation if you can. There you go. As, as we were saying before, support your cinemas, uh, support the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone, really. Oh, that's one other thing I want to... The support's been great. <laughs> that's one thing I want to shout out as well. One thing I want to specifically speak out about. Again, we're taking a bit of a hard left here, but I just... Go it's it. something that I want to mention, um, and then we can get back to being a bit more chill at the end. Um, at the time of recording this... Um, Many, I, I would usually mention this on And We're Rolling, but I got no real plans for an, anything for And We're Rolling at the minute, so I'll mention at the end of this as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a wrestling fan myself, so I know myself, uh, so I'll be very surprised if there's a lot of people out there who might be. There might be, I don't know. There might be major cinephiles who love wrestling as well. Um, <laughs> but at the minute, recently, the, the pro wrestling industry specific mainly focused on british wrestling actually has been going through their own me too movement at the moment uh the hashtag speaking out trend has happened uh talking about different experience where wrestlers and fans alike have been speaking out about experiences they've had uh with certain wrestlers that are either in a place of power or even um signed to wwe right now and to which i say i haven't had any i've been to many different shows i haven't had anything happen to me but again i'm not someone who i'm not someone who would traditionally be uh focused on by any one like that but i do want to say is if you are someone within the wrestling world or someone who is a wrestling fan who has had uh a poor experiences from anyone within the industry and are terrified to speak out because you know people in power they um have all you know they have the your their word against yours i just want to make this a platform to say don't feel like you can feel that way this is this matters to anyone as well i'm speaking this out because it's relevant within the wrestling world but just generally as well just don't just also this is a safe environment for anything of the like um anyone who has anything just so you know people are out there to support you even if there are people who are might terrify you but also there will be a greater number of people willing to support than there will be willing to put you down and i just want to mention that again i would usually have said that in and we're rolling but i you know, I don't know when the next time we're rolling will be. I just want to throw out yeah. that there. Similar thing about the um, about Black Lives Matter. It's never not going to be relevant to not be racist, and it's never not going to be relevant to speak out against any form of physical, mental, or sexual abuse. Just want to put that out there. Very nicely put, man. Right, bringing it back. Yes. Next week, we'll be discussing The Godfather Part 2. Get excited for that, because I'm very excited about that. I'm I'm very excited. Very excited. And again, keep up to date with the Intermission Podcast through Twitter and Instagram about anything. We are on YouTube, and we are also on Spotify. So go to all of those things. And again, keep safe, keep educated, and keep watching pretty solid films and yeah i've been oscar that's been robbie i've been robbie i, Hello. I should let you outro yourself i shouldn't that's all right you. you know what i'm gonna outro both of us i've been robbie he's been oscar represent and now you can take it from there because i'm not very good at this <laughs> thank you everybody for listening till next week we will see you all later and goodbye goodbye